Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third lecture, and actually it will be the numerical laboratory uh, on uh, seismic calculation. And today we will deal with uh, the uh, data processing procedure that we generally carry out when we uh, perform uh, dynamic tests on uh, full-scale devices uh, at the laboratory of your Center Foundation. Uh, and uh, generally these are procedures which are applied uh, uh, to all the laboratories uh, who performed, uh, which performed uh, uh, such a type uh, of test. So first of all, uh, I want to ask uh, if there is any question of what we have seen yesterday uh, according to the uh, experimental um, uh, testing protocol, rather than in the first lecture about uh, generally seismic isolation and all the typologies uh, that we have seen together. Uh, because today we are, we will be uh, focusing on the effective response, the real response of the full scale devices of some of them. And um, we will see a number of tests uh, um, by using uh, the MATLAB environment. I haven't uh, received uh, any email for the usage of the connection link uh, for the remote desktop, so I, I guess that uh, everyone has uh, uh, his own uh, his own uh, or her own uh, uh, MATLAB environment. Uh, so there is any question for uh, about the uh, what we have seen uh, in uh, the last lectures? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So yeah. I have one doubt. Yes. Uh, so, so yesterday when we were talking about the curved surface bearings, right? So yes. that time you mentioned the breakaway effect, right? So uh, if we are thinking about the breakaway effect, it causes a fixed building uh, sort of a thing, condition, right? So would it cause the superstructure to have some uh, um, destruct, sort of some destruction or drift? Because the base is fixed. So then we have a displacement later on, right? So when you are explaining the graph, I'm confused with that part a bit. Uh, yeah, I I have to ask to repeat uh, the final part of the question because uh, I didn't get it. So, so I wanted to know uh, how how does it cause like uh, how how are we going to uh, make sure that the superstructure is not not having any damage at that point? Okay. Uh, when yes. The break yes. I, okay. I see your point. Uh, so actually, this uh, will be the uh, final result of. Uh, um, the uh, structural analysis uh, uh, through uh, nonlinear time history uh, analysis. Uh, uh, generally, this is the main typology of analysis which is used for base isolation um, because uh, generally uh, isolators uh, provide uh, highly nonlinear behaviors. So the only um, the only device uh, which can be modeled uh, as a linear spring uh, is uh, the uh, rubber bearing solution. But uh, again, uh, also for uh, for this typology, generally uh, the uh, the response, uh, the time response uh, uh, analysis is uh, applied uh, just because uh, it is uh, the best uh, solution and the most realistic uh, analysis uh, that we can perform uh, on, on a building. And so generally, uh, we uh, firstly design the devices, uh, uh, maybe with uh, fast rules. Uh, then we uh, have to build uh, uh, a model, a finite element model of the whole structure in three dimensions uh, with, uh, uh, by considering uh, the superstructure as a linear elastic uh, structural system. And then uh, we have uh, obviously to, um, uh, to model also isolators uh, and then we can model uh, isolators as uh, linear springs uh, just for rubber bearings. But we have to pay attention with the lead rubber bearings uh, and uh, uh, surf, uh, curse, uh, curved surface sliders because we have to model them uh, in the uh, in a nonlinear way, so in the best way possible. And this is actually what we are going to do next week. Uh, we will try to uh, design uh, with the fast design rules uh, uh, the uh, three um, isolation systems uh, according to the three typologies that we have discussed together. And then we will build uh, also the finite element model of, a, of our case study structure, a very simple one, just to see uh, the overall procedure. And then we will perform uh, the um, nonlinear time history analysis according to a selection of uh, seismic events, uh, which are actually ground motion, real ground motions uh, in terms of natural uh, earthquakes. 
Uh, so uh, once you have performed the analysis, uh, you have uh, the time series of uh, moment uh, shear, shear force, uh, axial force, uh, you can get to an envelope, and then uh, you can design uh, all your structural elements uh, in order to withstand uh, uh, those uh, internal forces. Okay, so thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, generally, this is, uh, this is the procedure. Uh, I think that uh, the, um, there is also the possibility to apply the uh, response spectrum analysis, uh, um, but actually only for rubber bearings, uh, because they can be actually modeled uh, as uh, linear springs. So everything is linear together with the superstructure. So we are able also to apply a linear dynamic analysis, so the uh, superposition of the response spectrum uh, together with the model analysis uh, results. Uh, but uh, that is the only case. Uh, for lead rubber bearings uh, and curved surface lighters, so we do have to uh, carry out um, nonlinear time history analysis by applying a uh, time series of ground motions uh, at the base and by implementing uh, uh, special um, special links, uh, nonlinear links uh, for uh, as a representative uh, of the isolation devices. And actually for, for instance, for the lead rubber bearings uh, and for also for rubber bearings, uh, the, um, even though the rubber bearings can be modeled as a linear spring, uh, we know that uh, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, um, we almost, all, uh, almost always uh, uh, we have to design a hybrid systems so with rubber bearings, uh, which means that we, we do not have uh, only rubber bearings, but we have a combination of rubber bearings and flat sliders. And flat sliders uh, are highly nonlinear because of the, uh, we have just the purely frictional response, uh, which is hysteretic and nonlinear because of the uh, hysteretic rule is uh, rigid and then plastic. Um, so even though uh, the, the main uh, isolation devices are rubber bearings uh, and that they are just linear springs uh, from the horizontal point of view, we do have to consider also an, an additional nonlinear behavior, which is induced by the flat sliders, uh, where we have uh, a, mm, a supporting bearing uh, uh, location where we are not going to install uh, uh, actually uh, isolation devices, but just the uh, supports. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Okay, so if not, uh, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we are going to do exactly the same things. Uh, and uh, I've just copied the, the, uh, uh, the, the files uh, for the tests uh, on our um, shared folder in Google Drive. So you should find uh, the uh, where I where I generally store the videos uh, of the lectures uh, and the slides. You will find uh, another folder which is called uh, I think experimental data, and there there are uh, three uh, individual folders: uh, one related to rubber bearings, uh, one related to lead rubber bearings, uh, and the final one related to curved surface slider. Actually. For uh, both uh, rubber bearings and lead rubber bearings, uh, I have provided uh, uh, some tests uh, according to the standard code that we have seen yesterday, uh, the European standard code for anti-seismic devices, the N15129 of 2009. And actually, we will see the, um, um, uh, the overall uh, behavior by changing the shear strain, uh, by keeping fixed the, the uh, frequency and the vice versa, the frequency uh, dependence, uh, so that we uh, fix 100% uh, of uh, uh, lateral shear strain and then we vary the frequency value. And finally, we will consider, we, we will consider the repeated cycling uh, test. Uh, so uh, according to uh, 10 cy subsequent cycles, uh, we will be able to uh, see the degradation of the dynamic properties uh, of uh, isolators. Uh, so I share my screen uh, in the mean uh, that you are, uh, meanwhile you uh, download uh, the files. Okay, I don't have any slide because uh, uh, I want just to, um, uh, I mean, uh, just to explain a few uh, procedures that we are going to apply, and this is actually what I what I want to do. In the in the case that you think that you need a, a further um, explanation, please ask. 
uh, I briefly introduced uh, the first equations and the first uh, the overall uh, procedure that we have to apply, and then we will try to uh, to do it uh, through MATLAB. Okay. So we start with the rubber bearings. So let's start with the, the easiest uh, device. Okay, so yesterday we have seen that the main uh, dy dynamic properties, mechanical properties that we have to uh, consider according to e uh, the standard code EN 15129 are the, uh, let's call it K effective. So the effective stiffness, uh, which is uh, actually the second stiffness. at maximum displacement. Okay. And then together with this, we have also the damping, the equivalent viscous damping. And the equivalent viscous damping is given by the Jacobson formulation that we have considered in the first lecture. That is the EDC value the energy dissipated per cycle divided by two pi maximum displacement and maximum force. Okay, and for the second stiffness, we have, we will consider the force displacement loop and we will have something like this. We know that we have something very ellipsoidal and the stiffness is something like this. We have to connect the two points which have the maximum force and the maximum displacement. And the inclination, the slope of this linear branch will be the K effective, so the second stiffness, the effective stiffness, which is the secant at the maximum displacement. And uh, obviously these are properties uh, which can be computed for each cycle. Uh, in, this, uh, um, in this application, uh, we will consider actually uh, the, uh, the tests uh, that uh, have been provided by the testing protocol of uh, the, standard, the European standard code. And actually, as I mentioned before, we will consider the HC tests, which are the horizontal cyclic. We will consider the FD tests, so the frequency dependence. And then finally, the, the RC test the repeated cyclic. Okay, we will have just one repeated cyclic uh, and then we will have a number of uh, uh, horizontal cyclic and frequency dependence. So the horizontal cyclic uh, is the one which increase with increasing uh, uh, maximum uh, displacement uh, with a fixed value of uh, uh, frequency. And uh, the frequency dependence uh, uh, will be the opposite, actually. Uh, we will have a fixed value of displacement and we will vary and increase uh, the value of the frequency. And finally, the repeated cyclic is just a, a high number of uh, uh, subsequent tests, uh, actually 10, uh, 10 cycles. Okay, uh, so we let's have a look at the main, uh, uh, the main equations that we have to uh, keep in mind for the analysis of dynamic tests. 
we have to remind that uh, all these tests uh, that we have uh, mentioned before uh, have uh, a sinusoidal waveform. So this means that the input signals, uh, which is uh, the displacement over time, uh, is just a sinusoidal waveform. And maybe uh, we have uh, a different number of uh, cycles. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, we have uh, generally also a, a starting uh, and uh, an ending loop, uh, simply because uh, this the initial slope of the input signal is different than zero. So this means that we have, uh, yeah, if we would, uh, if we wanted to apply this uh, uh, this signal, we uh, we could not apply exactly this signal because we have an initial velocity uh, and we not uh, we cannot start from zero to uh, a given value different than zero uh, of, uh, of the velocity simply because there is no gap in nature. Uh, so we need a starting loop and uh, an ending loop, okay? So the data that I have provided are without uh, these, these two, okay? Because uh, the, the uh, software which provides actually the outcomes of the experimental tests uh, have already removed them. Uh, so we will consider directly all the uh, all the sequence uh, uh, of the of the tests. Uh, what we will have to do is uh, actually to separate uh, the contribution of all the cycles, uh, and then to compute uh, actually uh, the uh, EDC, uh, like uh, actually EDC, like the integral in the cycle uh, uh, of the force uh, times uh, the differential of displacement. Uh, you will see uh, that uh, it is very, uh, very easy because there is uh, um, an instruction in MATLAB uh, which is trapped, uh, uh, which simply uh, uh, is able to compute the uh, uh, the integral with respect to the uh, theory of the trapezoidal rule uh, of, of integration. So it is a very fast, uh, a very fast integration rule, uh, which can be easily done also in Excel, in, a, in an Excel uh, spreadsheet. Uh, if you if you need that, uh, we can also uh, see how to uh, how to do uh, exactly the same thing uh, also uh, within Excel. And so we will have uh, to consider the EDC value. We uh, and according to this value, we can uh, compute the damping uh, as uh, EDC divided by 2 pi d max f max. And uh, generally, we will compute uh, so the, uh, the damping value for each cycle uh, of the input signal. And uh, what changes actually from one cycle to another one is uh, obviously the uh, EDC value. The D max, uh, the maximum displacement is not expected to change uh, uh, just because uh, the uh, input signal uh, is uh, um, representative of uh, a sequence of the same, uh, exactly same uh, cycle, uh, cycles. So this means that the maximum displacement should be exactly equal for each, uh, uh, for each cycle. Maybe there is a numerical difference just because uh, that this is uh, 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 all the uh, signals that I have provided are feedback signals. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned yesterday, they will be um, actually uh, what the uh, testing equipment has, uh, um, has done effectively. Uh, so maybe it is not a fixed value, so, but there is a little bit of variation, but I think that uh, the variation will be uh, of the magnitude order of something like one tenth uh, of millimeter, uh, something like that. And then we will be able also to, uh, and also the, the the maximum force obviously varies because we have the degradation of the uh, of the response during cycles, and so also the uh, k effective will vary because the k effective can be computed uh, as uh, um, actually we we could say that uh, we could uh, uh, compute the effective stiffness as uh, f max uh, divided by d max, okay? But uh, in this way, we are not capturing uh, the uh, effective slope uh, of the line uh, which connects uh, the maximum and the minimum point. Uh, this is just uh, an equivalent slope uh, 
of, of the line between the origin of the force displacement loop and the maximum force point. And we don't know uh, which will be the point with maximum force because uh, it could be at the positive values of forces uh, or negative. Uh, so this means that uh, the, the best formula to compute the K effective is uh, F maximum positive minus F maximum negative divided by D maximum positive minus D maximum negative. So that we will be able to capture exactly, you see, uh, the slope of this line because we are connect in this way with the second expression, we are capturing actually the slope of the line which connects these two points. Otherwise with the first equation, uh, we capture just the, the line uh, which uh, connects the origin and the maximum force, which could be here, but it could be also here. Generally, uh, it is here simply because uh, we have the degradation uh, uh, as the cycles goes by. Uh, so the, uh, the degradation of the force. So this means that uh, in this region, uh, the forces should be lower than here, uh, a little bit lower, uh, depending um, on the degradation. Can I ask something? Yes. Uh, in the equation that you've written like uh, one minute ago, you, you consider the, the uh, forces with, with their sign, of course. Yeah, exactly. Like yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just because uh, F uh, max minimum, because here we should have uh, a summation of two numbers. So in yeah. this way, if you consider F maximum uh, negative uh, with, a, uh, with a minus, uh, minus and minus uh, becomes plus. Yes, uh, this, is, uh, this is a good observation. Uh, we have to keep uh, the same... Uh, uh, the same uh, uh, symbol for uh, max F maximum positive and F maximum minimum. Um, and this will be very easy in MATLAB uh, simply because we will do uh, for this uh, F maximum plus, we will, uh, we will write the maximum of uh, the vector of force. And uh, for F max minimum, we will, we will write a minimum so that the minimum will be uh, for sure uh, a negative value. And the same for displacements. Uh, okay, I think that this, uh, uh, this is what we are going to do. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's consider which are, uh, let's, uh, let's remind which are actually the, um, uh, the signals that uh, I have provided. So first of all, there will be the signals. Uh, the first signal is, is uh, time. The second is uh, the uh, horizontal displacement. Okay. Then we have the horizontal force and these are signals and then you are given to the a single value of the vertical load which is assumed constant for the whole duration of the test and uh, that's it for uh, rubber bearings and the lead rubber bearings uh, simply because we don't have uh, any movement from the vertical point of view then we will consider also the vertical motion uh, for uh, uh, curved surface sliders, uh, just because uh, we have, we do have a motion uh, due to the pendulum uh, uh, movement induced by the spherical surface. Um, okay, so uh, what we can consider here simply because we are considering uh, the uh, horizontal cyclic uh, rather than the frequency dependence, we don't have in these, uh, uh, in these signals, the information uh, of uh, uh, the frequency. So we have uh, to try to compute it, actually the frequency and uh, how to do that actually. Uh, so we, now in the signals, uh, we just have uh, the information of displacement and uh, the information of time. So according to this, uh, we can actually compute the information of velocity by uh, computing the first derivative of the displacement with respect to time. And then with uh, those signals, then we can come up to uh, a measurement of the frequency. And uh, it will be uh, 
uh, it will be uh, very easy to compute the uh, the velocity simply because there will be um, the velocity will be defined according to the uh, differential quotient. Uh, uh, and there is uh, a very fast command in the in the MATLAB uh, to compute uh, to compute actually the velocity, but also again uh, also in Excel it, it is possible just by uh, by writing the equation of the um, uh, of the differential quotient. Uh, I think that uh, these are the main equations, uh, but uh, I think that best way to uh, to see it to understand to understand uh, all of these uh, is just to try to uh, to tense on numbers uh, uh, and to see what happens. So let's open MATLAB. Okay. So I just want to start with the uh, with the file with the, uh, which uh, actually considers uh, just the rubber bearing uh, tests, which is actually the first uh, typology that we are going to consider. Uh, then I generally start with uh, three uh, comments, which is uh, clear all uh, CLC, which is clear screen and close all, just to clear all the, uh, uh, all the variables in the workspace uh, uh, for previous, uh, maybe uh, you have run some uh, some previous scripts. Uh, you clear the common window and you close uh, all the previous figures uh, that have been created. Then we save. Uh, what I recommend you to do is to save uh, the uh, the programs that we are going to uh, to implement uh, within a, a folder where we also store the three folders that we have downloaded from the shared folder in Google Drive, where we have actually all the, uh, all the tests. Then we will uh, recall uh, all the file names uh, uh, directly into the script, okay? So let's call it uh, uh, rubber bearing analysis. And generally V1, uh, version one, version two, uh, and generally we go up to uh, version 100 whenever you have uh, to upgrade uh, your uh, your script. Okay. Um, so now let's let's have a look at uh, some uh, uh, some important rules uh, also to uh, recall and to load the files. Uh, all the files that I provided. For its rubber bearings, so you see they are uh, dot mat. So this means that they are already um, workspaces uh, uh, for MATLAB environment. So we have just to write load and the name of file. Um, in order to do this, uh, we can do uh, exactly uh, what uh, what I'm going to write. So we will do uh, we will create a variable which is actually the list of all the files, and then we will choose uh, the number of a single file to carry out some analysis. So we, uh, let's create a list, which is a variable, which will be uh, the uh, list of the files. The command is dir. And then uh, here we will have to uh, add a, a string, which is actually the name of uh, the folder where we have to search files. So it is uh, rb backslash and uh, uh, let's uh, set also the extension of the files so uh, that it is uh, very easy for the program to find them uh, so the star uh, dot uh, mat okay so uh, if i press f5 if i run this uh, uh, this script uh, you see there is a structure uh, in the workspace, uh, and uh, if you double click on the structure, you have uh, uh, all the characteristics of all the files uh, within that uh, that folder. You have the name, uh, the actual folder, uh, the date, the bytes, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we will focus just on the name. Okay. If you don't understand uh, something that I see uh, that I, that I write, uh, please ask. So now uh, let's do uh, very easily uh, the work for just one uh, one test, and then we we will try to extend uh, the the same data process for uh, a series of files. Because uh, generally this is what uh, what uh, I do when I have to perform uh, data processing. Uh, we will uh, you have to proceed by steps, 
And so you have to start by looking at the uh, local level uh, at, a, at a single file. And then uh, if you are able to generalize the overall procedure, then uh, you can also uh, consider a sequence of file, uh, everything, to, everything together, I mean. But uh, if you consider everything together, you have also to pay attention to create some variables uh, which uh, tries to store uh, all the uh, all the uh, variables that you need, uh, or I mean, uh, all the mechanical properties uh, rather than uh, input signals and so on. So let's do uh, just for a single file. Uh, and so we, um, uh, we try to define um, uh, a dummy variable, which is uh, IF. So this is uh, the number of files that we want to consider. So let's start from the first. And so the file name, uh, in order to load that file, uh, we will write, we will type load. And we have to build up uh, a string, uh, which uh, is related to the, the, the file name. Actually, there is uh, a first part, which is fixed, uh, which is uh, the name of the uh, rubber bearing uh, folder. And then we can, uh, we can put the name of the file that we, uh, we are going to select, so list at the ith file. We, uh, sim, uh, since uh, this is a structure, we have to select uh, just a, uh, a characteristic of uh, the height row, uh, which is actually the name. OK. So if we run this, uh, we get actually the content of the file uh, within, uh, uh, within the workspace. Uh, you see that there are uh, the um, signals for displacements, the signal for the force, the signal of time, and the numerical value of the applied vertical load. OK, so we have everything here. Uh, let's have a look at, at the command window, and then we will go on with the script. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, main outcome of, uh, uh, of the experimental test. So if we just write plot, time displacement. In this way, we see uh, the uh, input signal. Uh, and actually, this is uh, the feedback uh, version of the signal. So this means uh, that this is actually what the testing equipment has uh, effectively done. And you see, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are values, uh, obviously, in meters. And you have uh, here time in seconds. We have three subsequent cycles, as uh, is ruled uh, for. Uh, uh, OK, actually, we don't know the file name. So uh, it's better also to remind the file name. Uh, let's call it uh, here, F name. Uh, and we call it as this portion of, OK? OK, this is better so that we can also have uh, the, uh, OK, this is a FD, so the frequency dependence. Uh, so we have a fixed value of displacement, and then we vary uh, the, uh, the frequency and consequently uh, uh, the velocity. So again, uh, this is the signal of displacement, so the feedback. So this is uh, actually what uh, the, the testing equipment has done. And you see that there is no starting and ending loops, OK? So because they have been already removed. Uh, another issue is that if we type grid on, the grid is set in the, uh, in the graph. And uh, you see that uh, this is the line for zero value, so for zero displacements, uh, but uh, the signal doesn't start from zero and doesn't end to zero, OK? So this is simply because uh, the, um, the procedure for cutting the uh, starting and ending loop uh, has an approximation uh, which uh, actually uh, is, depend is depending on the uh, sampling frequency. Uh, the, what I didn't mention before is that all the signals uh, are sampled within, uh, uh, within the time uh, axis. And so this means that what we see in the graph as uh, a continuous signal actually 
it is just a set of points. So this means that this is a point, this is another point. Obviously, it is uh, much, much more uh, high the number of points, but this is just for you to understand. Okay, and the intervals of time, which is dt, the variation of time between uh, two consequent points, uh, this is fixed, and this is related to uh, the sampling frequency. And uh, generally, uh, we have uh, dt equal to one over the sampling frequency. Okay, and the sampling frequency generally for dynamic tests uh, is a set, okay, it is generally a, a power of two. Uh, and uh, generally for dynamic tests is uh, something like uh, um, 256 Hertz. Okay, so this means that the, uh, the variation of time between uh, all the subsequent points uh, is uh, something like uh, uh, 0.0039 seconds. Okay. Um, so almost four by 10 to the minus three seconds uh, uh, is the, inter the time interval between uh, all the um, between all the uh, subsequent points. Uh, so it is a very short DT, um, and so this means that uh, okay, we can approximately uh, say that the um, the overall behavior is continuous. Uh, uh, is fair enough for a continuous signal, and. Uh, uh, this, is, this allows us to use also, um, I mean, uh, differential quotient for the computation of velocity and so on. So the, uh, the, smaller, uh, the smaller the uh, time, uh, the time uh, interval, uh, the, uh, the better is uh, the approximation for velocity uh, by using the differential quotient. So let's go back to MATLAB. So we were looking at this uh, and uh, According to this, uh, we can uh, also understand uh, that the, the first and the last point are not uh, perfectly zero, simply because if we zoom here and we go to see actually the uh, points, uh, you see there are a lot of points here. So it is, uh, we can also do a little bit better for this uh, selection uh, of the starting end. Uh, Dr. Marco, can you please uh, move the figure a bit to the right so that we can see the uh, the text of the code? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but uh, then, oh, uh, yeah, now I will close this. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, you see that here uh, we have uh, a lot of numbers uh, up to zero. Okay, be, uh, above zero. So this means that there, uh, we can choose uh, actually a better point uh, for the zero location. So something like here, okay? So this is actually what we are going to do uh, now. So first of all, uh, if uh, we are given to these signals, uh, how to uh, determine the, the, um, uh, the uh, sampling frequency, because uh, we don't know actually now the, what is the, uh, the sampling frequency. Well, we can just open the, uh, uh, the signal of time. We look at the second value and you see the second value is uh, just one value of uh, uh, time interval. And you see that uh, this is exactly, okay, there are a number of, uh, um, of uh, uh, digits, but uh, at least uh, approximately, four by 10 to the minus three seconds uh, is exactly uh, a sampling frequency of uh, 256 Hertz. As you see here, if I perform, if I compute one divided by 256, uh, you get exactly this number. So um, this test is sampled according to a frequency, uh, a sampling frequency of 256 uh, Hertz. Um, so now let's have a look at the um, velocity. So how to compute the velocity? 
there are two ways. Uh, um, the first one is the definition of the differential quotient. Uh, so this is, uh, the, uh, I want to do that uh, even if uh, this is uh, a little bit longer, but very brief. Um, just because uh, this is exactly, these are the, exactly the same expressions that you can use also in Excel. Uh, and then uh, I will show you how to compute it uh, in a very easy and fast way. Um, so the differential quotient is something like that. I just switch from uh, uh, PowerPoint to uh, MATLAB just to explain all the expressions. Uh, then if uh, I'm if I'm saying something which is uh, too trivial, uh, just uh, just tell me that uh, I will go a little bit faster. So the velocity, uh, I mean, uh, uh, at the height. Uh, at the height time instant is equal to the ratio between the displacement at the height time instant minus the displacement at the previous time instant divided by, okay, uh, now we know that uh, the, um, all the signals uh, are sampled uh, uh, with a constant frequency, uh, sampling frequency, so we can say, okay, divided by the T, okay? Um, let's try to write these uh, in MATLAB. So in MATLAB, we can, um, we can use uh, a four cycle. So four I, which goes from one, uh, sorry, for two to uh, the length of the signal time. And you see that I start from two and not from one. Uh, simply because uh, in the expression of, of the differential quotient, uh, I div um, the numerator is uh, the displacement at the ith time instant minus the displacement uh, at the ith minus one. So uh, if uh, I set the first, the very first point at one, uh, we get uh, the displacement at zero, which is uh, uh, which doesn't exist uh, because the first uh, uh, index of the vector is uh, uh, one. So we have to start from two. So velocity at the ith time instant is equal to displacement at the ith minus displacement at the ith minus one, okay, divided by the time interval, which has not been uh, defined already. So we can just say that t equal to t at two minus t at one. Okay, we can just say also t at two, t at two, uh, but uh, generally we can, uh, we can write this expression whenever we have uh, the first time instant, which is not exactly zero, but uh, it is uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, five seconds because uh, you, we have uh, uh, zero pairs. Uh, so we have a number of zeros uh, just, to, just to, for the equipment to wait uh, a little bit of seconds. Uh, so let's write here uh, t2 uh, minus t1 so that uh, we, uh, we will not be uh, in mistakes. Okay, uh, let's try to run. Perfect. Um, okay, there is an issue uh, which uh, seems to be uh, uh, useless, but it, it is uh, very important for computations. Uh, you see that uh, if I write the expression like this, uh, the velocity vector is a row vector, but all the other signals, and this is what happens whenever signals are returned by the testing equipment, all the other signals are column vectors. So in order to be consistent with the definition of, of all the other signals, let's write, let's define the velocity vector as a column vector. So in order to do this, we can just do, uh, set the height uh, row, uh, with uh, uh, okay, uh, double dot is just uh, whatever is already set, which is actually one. So if we run again, you see that uh, the velocity vector becomes uh, uh, a column vector. So now everything is consistent, and uh, if we plot the um, velo time versus velocity which is actually velocity versus times, but in, in MATLAB, uh, you, you have to write, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, horizontal axis and then the, the vertical axis. Okay, uh, this is 
this is the graphical result. We get approximately uh, 13 centimeters per second. Yeah, 13.4 maximum velocity. Uh, what I want you to, uh, to notice uh, is that, uh, okay, the shape uh, is exactly a cosine. Okay, so this, is, uh, this looks meaningful uh, because uh, the, the first derivative of a sine is actually a cosine uh, with a positive symbol. So this, is, uh, this looks at least the, the right shape. Um, regarding the, um, uh, the numerical value, uh, generally we are given to the testing protocol so we can check if the maximum velocity is actually the one, uh, the one which is returned by the graphical results. Uh, and this is actually the case. Uh, and then uh, these are values in meter per second, okay? And you see in the very initial point that there is something strange. Uh, if I just zoom here, okay, I want to move, okay. You see that there is a gap. Uh, the very first point is at a zero and the second point starts to uh, the approximately the maximum value. Something like, okay, yeah, 13, uh, uh, 132 millimeter per second. So why this happens? Uh, because uh, actually, uh, if we have a cosine, uh, we usually assume that the first derivative is, is a cosine and the cosine starts from a different than zero value uh, at the beginning. Uh, actually, this happens uh, due to because of the definition of the differential quotient, okay? We start from two and uh, we set at uh, this definition, uh, the first definition uh, for the velocity at the second component uh, of the velocity vector. So if we open the velocity vector, you see that uh, automatically the first uh, component is set to zero because uh, it is not defined. And then the, from the second to the other, uh, the, uh, expo the equation starts to provide uh, um, actual values. So this is the main reason. Uh, um, actually, if we do this uh, um, in this way with the differential quotient, uh, we get a final vector of velocity, which has exactly the same length uh, of uh, all the other uh, signals. Uh, what I mentioned before is uh, the other definition, uh, I mean, uh, the other strategy for the computation of velocity, which is uh, the following. Uh, I just comment these expressions uh, and I write the V equal to diff of D divided, uh, dot divided by, which means that uh, all the single components are divided uh, between the, the vectors, uh, diff of time. And this is exactly, this is a very fast uh, strategy to say, uh, to, to set uh, a differential quotient in MATLAB. And uh, if I run these, uh, uh, this particular uh, command, you see here the velocity now uh, is actually one component less with respect to the other signals, okay? This is simply because this uh, command diff uh, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't consider the initial zero value which was set uh, according to the previous uh, definition strategy for the velocity. Okay, so it is exactly the same because uh, if we plot actually the new velocity vector. Okay, I cannot say plot again a t and v because now t has uh, seven thousand seventy seven hundred and fifty. Uh, components, uh, whereas the velocity now has uh, 7,749 components. But I can just see the velocity value and uh, you see that the, the values are exactly the same, uh, approximately 130 millimeter per second. So this is exactly the same vector, uh, but um, exception made for the number of components uh, because we have one component less and uh, uh, Actually, we don't start from zero, but we start from the uh, very uh, the initial the initial velocity. Um, anyway, uh, we have to in order to plot exactly um, I mean uh, the velocity with respect to time, we have to uh, be consistent with uh, the length of the vectors. 
So this means that, that we can use this uh, strategy, but maybe uh, we can say, okay, we can add the missing component and maybe we can say uh, the previous strategy uh, has uh, the uh, first component, uh, which is uh, zero. And we know that the first, uh, the first derivative uh, uh, of the displacement with respect to time, if the displacement is a sinusoidal, uh, we have a cosine and the cosine has the maximum velocity at the beginning. Okay, so the first value would be V1 and then I will put V. If I run now, you see the velocity vector now has exactly the same length of the previous signals. And now I can write plot t comma v. And now if I just zoom here, you see there is a horizontal branch for one dt. And this is actually because uh, I've set the velocity value equal for both the points. Okay, but this is just for four by 10 to the minus three duration. So it is very small. Okay, uh, and uh, this is fair enough for our, uh, for our computations. So now we have the information of displacement and velocity. Okay. And we can try to come up with uh, uh, the frequency. So let's have a look at the maximum displacement. So the maximum, uh, let's say, uh, just to be uh, uh, precise, uh, the maximum of the absolute value of uh, the displacement signal is, uh, OK, uh, 215 millimeters. And uh, the maximum, the same for velocity is uh, okay that value so in order to compute the frequency and this is actually an average value of frequency we can just say okay the frequency the frequency is uh, the velocity which is uh, 0.1347 divided by 2 times pi times uh, the maximum displacement which is uh, 0.215 Okay, I guess that this is uh, this has to be rounded. Uh, this is actually 0.1 Earth, okay, uh, which was actually one of the frequencies for the frequency dependence uh, uh, dependence test. 0.1 Earth. Um, okay, let's write here uh, the procedure, but uh, we have to try to generalize uh, the overall computations. Okay, so D max. Is equal, is equal to maximum of absolute value of D. The maximum velocity V max is equal to the maximum of the absolute value of velocity. And the frequency, the average frequency is equal to V max divided by two pi D max. Okay. And then maybe we don't need uh, many digits, but we need uh, just one. So we can do, uh, okay, around. And we say uh, keep it, uh, keep it just one digit. Okay. And we get the frequency equal to 0 0.1 Hertz. Okay. So in this way, we are rounding uh, with what, just one digit uh, the final result uh, of that computation uh, so that we uh, just forget about all the uh, useless digits after the first, uh, just because of the input frequency uh, ruled by the standard code uh, is just 0 0.1, 0 0.5, uh, and 2. So uh, we just need the one, uh, one digit for the frequency. OK, so the. Um, this is actually uh, the procedure for the computation of frequency. We can also try to do this. Um, let's uh, see how much the, uh, the feedback is different with respect to the, uh, uh, the reference signal. So let's assume, uh, let's compare actually the two signals by considering the harmonic motion. Uh, so what I, 
I was uh, mentioning is the following. We want to, to provide the figure with the, the feedback value of the signal of displacement, which is actually returned by the test. Then we say all doll in order to superpose uh, uh, different plots. And then uh, we want to uh, compute a numerical value, uh, I mean, a numerical signal for displacement, uh, the, uh, the correct one. So D numerical, let's call it D numerical, is equal to D max times sinus of two times pi times frequency times t. Okay. And let's try to overlap this signal with respect to the uh, experimental one. Okay. And write, let's write the legend, which is uh, the first one uh, is the experimental and the second one is the numerical. Okay, then we have uh, the uh, X label, which is actually the uh, time. And the Y label is uh, displacement in meter. And then we can do, okay, grid the minor, grid on, box on, uh, which are just uh, co uh, comments for the, uh, the, the internal grid and the external box. Okay. If we run the script, you see this is uh, the comparison. Okay. Um, this is not because uh, the, there is a little bit of uh, difference between the two. But uh, it doesn't look like there is a difference because they are uh, uh, the, the equipment uh, didn't have the capacity to perform the test. But uh, you see that it seems to have a, a little bit of delay. Okay, and uh, this is mainly because uh, you see here the experimental signal doesn't start from zero, whereas the um, actually we have the numerical one which starts from zero. So maybe we can try to add uh, this uh, delay also from the numerical point of view so that we are able to clearly, uh, to clearly compare the two signals. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the initial delay, 0.1484, which is a time instant. Okay. So in order to do this, to add this delay, we just need to uh, subtract this value from the time vector, which is 0 0.1484. Okay, let's run. Okay, now they look exactly overlapped. And there is uh, again, a little bit of difference and the difference now is not delay because here they are very, very near, very close one to each other, here no. Uh, so I think that these, uh, this is actually the feedback, the, um, the uh, difference between the feedback and the reference. But uh, given these uh, graphical comparison, we can uh, directly say that uh, the uh, testing equipment provided uh, a very good uh, representation of the test. So how did you compare? Uh, compute the delay again. I, I yeah. Didn't see um, that. I just erase these uh, so so that uh, you can see. Okay, I run again uh, the previous version of the uh, of the script. This was the initial result. So I go back. This is just graphically. I just zoomed at the uh, initial uh, time instant, and you okay. see that the interval, uh, the the delay is computed by looking at the, uh, sorry, the zero, the time instant where we have a zero value of displacement at the experimental signal. So we, uh, we have the zero line, you click on the zero point and you see, okay, you can okay. say this, this or the previous one. I set the previous one, which is a little bit lower than zero, mm -hmm. uh, but this is the overall procedure. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, this is just a comparison for the numerical uh, signal, uh, just to show that the effective, uh, uh, the feedback signals uh, is actually uh, the proper one. Uh, it is, uh, it's uh, a very good approximation uh, of uh, what is uh, um, set as input uh, in the testing equipment. So now uh, let's see uh, how to, which is a, a very, um, it seems tricky, but it is, uh, uh, it is very easy once uh, you understand just few, uh, few rules. Um, we just need to, um, I mean, uh, isolate uh, all the cycles. Okay, because then for all the cycles, we have to compute the uh, mechanical properties. So I just go back briefly into the PowerPoint just to uh, allow you to understand the procedure. Okay, so for, um, uh, for the counting, uh, of cycles okay let's have a look at this uh, graph okay i have to enlarge And this is actually what happens. Okay, T and D. Okay, uh, in order to uh, isolate these, the first cycle and the second cycle, and then the third is exactly the same. What we need is the definition of the zero displacement points. So we need a procedure to determine this point, this point, this point, this point and this point. And then we should be able to consider, okay, the first cycle is from the first and the third point. And the second cycle will be between the third and the fifth. Okay, so first of all, the first expression, uh, I mean, the first procedure allows us to compute the zero displacement points. And then we, uh, we will have to set all the cycles uh, uh, by considering from one to uh, from the the first to the third, from the third to the fifth, from the fifth to the seventh, and so on. Uh, so odd numbers uh, actually. So in order to do this, uh, okay, uh, we can just consider um, that this signal is uh, not a continuous signal, but it is a discrete. So this means that we have a number of points, okay? And actually what happens is that if I consider this point, if I want to enlarge this picture, we have the, the time axis, then we have the, the signal, this is the signal, this is time axis. And then points, uh, we don't have exactly a single point at the 0.0, .0 value of displacement, but we have a discrete uh, behavior of the signal, which means that we will have surely one point with a very low value of displacement, but positive. And then one point with a very low value of displacement, but negative, okay? It is impossible in reality uh, to um, actually to sample a, sig a signal, a discrete signal with exactly zero value of displacement. It is impossible. So it could be close to zero, but actually we have uh, uh, either a positive or a negative value, okay? So how to, um, how to find the first or the, or the second uh, points in a, in a procedure? Because, okay, these 
number could be uh, actually the uh, my zero point, but also this one, maybe the minimum of the two is uh, actually can be represented by the uh, the minimum uh, the, the zero location. Well, I see that uh, if I'm located here, these are all positive values. And uh, below zero, all of these points uh, are negative values, uh, okay? So but the, the overall procedure is to go point by point, uh, okay? And to compute the product, the symbol actually, the, the sign of the product between two consecutive points, okay? So if uh, the sign of these two points is positive, uh, this is not a zero point. If the product is negative, like in this case, plus times minus becomes minus, okay, that is a minus. I mean, that is a zero point. Does it work also for negative values? Yes, because if we are here, the product between two negative values becomes plus. So this means that the sign is positive, also, uh, also when uh, values are negative and there is no zero point, so that this uh, is not stored uh, is not stored as a, as a zero point. Okay, so I go for uh, I consider all the points uh, starting from the second, obviously, because we have uh, uh, exactly as the uh, differential quotient, uh, we have to uh, consider one point and the previous one, and then to uh, product uh, to to multiply the numerical value. So this means that if sign of the height times the height minus one is equal to one, which means plus one, nothing happens, okay? This is no zero point. Otherwise, that is the i, the height point is a zero point. So we can store the, uh, um, I mean, uh, a variable, uh, an external variable, uh, which is uh, actually a recurrent variable. And they will store the height index, okay? So in this way, we are able to uh, store all the height values uh, where we have uh, actually the product between uh, two consecutive, uh, consecutive points, uh, uh, displacement values uh, uh, as negative. So this means that there is uh, actually this situation. Okay, is, uh, I hope is that clear. Um, let's try to do this in MATLAB. Okay, I just want to comment this uh, uh, comparison, uh, the numerical comparison, because uh, this is uh, this has been already done. Okay, in order to write the recurrent uh, expression the, uh, for the uh, the zero points uh, detection, uh, we have to define initially the variable as an empty variable. Okay, ZP stands for zero points. Okay, then uh, let's have a look at uh, the whole signal of displacement for I, which goes from two to the length of displacement, which is also the length of the time, but Nevertheless, they are exactly equal in length. Okay, so if the sign of the product between D at the height instant times D at the height minus one, if this is, uh, uh, okay, actually, if it is equal to plus one, nothing happens. So uh, I don't write it. Uh, I just write here instructions and comments of where something happens. 
So if uh, this is less than one, uh, I mean less than zero, let's say, if it is uh, uh, negative, the product is negative, this means that I have to update my vector zero points. Zero points is equal to the previous zero points, and then we have to add the height, the height index. And okay. So this, in order to see if we are doing right, uh, let's have a look at the graphical results. So plot t versus uh, displacement, although in order to superpose uh, uh, graphs, and then we plot also t at zero points and d at zero points. And uh, we do it uh, uh, as red dots, red circles. Okay, let's highlight the line width. Okay, this is just the thickness uh, of the uh, of the line of the plot. Okay, let's try to see if that if it works. You see that uh, it works. All these points uh, are highlighted. And uh, also you see that now the signal starts ex approximately exactly from zero. So there is no initial branch with uh, actually two centimeters is not so small. So we can, we can also try to, um, uh, to consider just this cycle without this initial branch. And the same also for the final cycle without this initial branch. Uh, uh, sorry, this final branch. OK. So this is a, an easy rule uh, for, um, for the computation of the zero points. And actually, this can be applied not only to displacements, but to any kind of, uh, uh, of signals. Uh, so now we are applying this uh, rule to the displacement signal, but uh, this is generally applied, uh, can be applied to uh, all the signals that you have. Uh, the main rule is that you, uh, okay, the main issue is related to um, the noise, uh, the possible uh, uh, noise of the, uh, of the signal, because if you have a very regular signal, Maybe you have a subsequent changing in a plus and minus symbol for the values, but here this is not what happens here, and this is generally what is done in data in data processing. We have to filter all the signals by removing the as much as possible the 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 eventual noises which can be induced by the electrical equipment. Okay. So now let's have a look at the, um, the zero point vector. This is the zero point vector, which has actually seven components. Okay. So seven components by looking at the, uh, the figure, we have seven, com uh, seven components, which uh, means uh, seven zero points, and we have uh, three cycles. So this means that we have, and that we have actually three points per cycle, okay? Because we have the starting point, the medium point, where we have actually the maximum velocity, uh, and the um, the ending point. Okay. So let's try to consider um, the and to uh, plot actually the displacement signal for every, uh, I mean, uh, for every uh, cycle. So for height, which goes from one to three. Okay. And then we want to create a figure. Okay, let's create it before. 
or okay maybe yeah no that is that is fair enough okay uh, we will use the previous figure to um, superpose the different colors uh, for all the cycles so that we are uh, sure that we are doing right okay um, let's try to do this so we want to plot again t versus the displacement but we want to do it uh, uh, cycle by cycle okay so let's consider the first cycle uh, so the first cycle goes from the 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 and the same also for displacements okay but i want to consider an uh, an automatically updated index for these uh, um, for these limits okay i don't want to write from 0 0.1 to 3 and then to write another expression for 3 to 5 and then another one for 5 to 7 uh, because maybe uh, for repeated cyclic tests uh, we have 10 cycles and uh, I want to write just a single script uh, which uh, which does ac actually everything okay regardless of the number of the of the cycles so I think that the uh, uh, the proper uh, expression for the indexes are uh, the proper expression is the following three times i minus two so let's consider this. Um, if uh, i is equal to one, so the first cycle, we have a three minus two, which is one. Okay, this is good. And then this should be equal to three, and then should be equal to five, and then equal to, um, equal to seven. So uh, this should be equal to three times i, Okay, minus, uh, I think, again, two, because uh, uh, this uh, should be, okay, let's, uh, I generally write it in Excel because it's better. One, two, three, and then we have one, three, um, one, three, five, three, five, seven. Okay, it's better to write because uh, uh, otherwise uh, you will crazy. Uh, this is the uh, number of cycle. This is the first point, uh, let's say index. And uh, this is the uh, the final index. Okay. So let's try to compute expressions for this. And so I, what I mentioned is uh, three times uh, the cycle minus two. Okay, and this is not actually what we want to obtain because we get four and seven. So this is not what we need. And this is, so we did, I think this is two, okay, two minus one. Uh, two times I minus one. This one, maybe. minus one, yes. And then yeah. this, yes, exactly. And this should be um, two times, uh, the cycle plus one. Okay, yes. So the first is two times i minus one, whereas the, the final index is two times i plus one. Okay, so you see we get exactly the same. And this works also where um, for tests with the 10 cycles, 20 cycles, or whatever. Okay. Let's go back and let's write this. So this is two and this is one and this is two and then plus one. And so I, uh, we have to write here two times i minus one, two times i plus one. Okay, and let's set also the different thickness. Let's see. Yes, okay. 
I think it works. You see all the cycles have different colors. Okay. So now we are able to consider actually cycle by cycle. So you see, we are keeping a lot of time for this, but uh, this is actually the same for all the, uh, for all the tests and all, also for the other typology of, uh, of devices. So uh, once we have done this, uh, uh, everything is straightforward. Okay, so once we have, uh, uh, we can consider just the single cycle. Okay, there is just one more, uh, one more operation because uh, you see that here we have four i, which goes from one to three, because we know that we have uh, three cycles, but we know uh, we want to uh, actually set a general, a general script. So how to compute the number of cycles? So we have seen that the, by looking at the figure, we have uh, three uh, point, zero points per cycle, but the, the last is always the first of the subsequent. Okay, but uh, if we look at uh, if we neglect the first the very first point, uh, you see that the, for the first cycle we have two, for the other one we have another two, and uh, for the third the other two. So we have uh, seven components for the zero point vector. We just subtract one, and we get six. Uh, six divided by two is equal to three. Which is actually the, the the number of cycles. So we for the computation of the number of cycles, let's uh, write it here, and cycles equal to um, length of zero points minus one divided by two. Okay. So here number of cycles, let's run, and that's it. The software now, the script now automatically uh, understands from the signal how many cycles we have. We have three cycles, and then can actually consider a cycle by cycle. Okay, we are almost done. Uh, and then we can run uh, this procedure for all the tests. Um, so here we have uh, these, uh, but we can see, uh, okay, this is uh, just a plot for displacements and it is okay. So let's call the displacement of the cycle, which is an additional uh, variable equal to exactly this portion. Okay, which is actually the, the displacement signal uh, between the, the time instance uh, of uh, the single cycle. Okay, and uh, we can do this also for the force. The force of the cycle is equal to the force vector according to the same indexes. Okay, so in this way, we are able to uh, just isolate a force displacement single loop within the same test. Okay, so let's go back to see uh, which are the main mechanical properties that we have to compute. So we have to compute the uh, effective stiffness with the maximum and minimum force, then uh, the uh, energy dissipated per cycle and the consequent value for, uh, the, um, uh, for the damping, okay? And then uh, I think that's it. So let's start from the uh, effective stiffness. Okay. So the effective stiffness, K effective, and uh, it is for the height cycle. This is equal to the maximum of the force of the single cycle minus the minimum of the force of the single cycle divided by the maximum of displacement of the single cycles minus the minimum of the displacement of the single cycle. Okay. Then we have to compute the uh, energy dissipated per cycle for all the cycles. 
which is equal to the uh, area enclosed within uh, the historic loop, which is traps, which is actually the expression in MATLAB for the computation of the integral uh, with the trapezoidal uh, theory. And we have to just to, to write traps of DC, comma, FC. And this automatically does the um, computes the, um, the integral and uh, returns the, uh, the energy dissipated per cycle. So here we can write uh, the um, damping. We can call it C for the height uh, cycle. This is equal to the energy dissipated per cycle of the height uh, cycle divided by two times pi times maximum displacement of the cycle, which is generally equal, times the maximum force of the cycle. Okay. Let's run. Okay, there is no error. And uh, we can go to the, for instance, to the um, to the damping. We see that there are damping ratios of approximately uh, 6 .9, 6 .6, uh, let's say 7% of damping. Then we have the values of uh, um, energy dissipated per cycle, and we have the effective stiffnesses. Okay, so if you want to see uh, what happens uh, for all the cycles, uh, we can provide some bar plot. Figure, for instance, uh, bar, um, for instance, for the damping. Let's say something. Okay. So the X label, the X label is a cycle, a cycle number. And then here we have a damping. We should have, okay, also the, uh, this is the number. If we write uh, slash, uh, backslash uh, uh, C, the MATLAB uh, writes the uh, Greek uh, char. For C, which is actually what we know, uh, what we assume uh, as damping ratio. Uh, okay, let's have a look at this. Okay, you see C as a number and cycle number. There is a, degrad a, a slight degradation of damping, uh, even though I think that uh, an asymptotic value is reached uh, at the third point. And we start from approximately 7% of damping ratio. And this is actually um, a rubber bearing, a purely rubber bearing, uh, which means that we are very close to a low damping rubber bearing uh, because 6% uh, uh, is actually the limit for uh, the European standard code for low damping rubber bearings. And then we, we can do also the same for the DC, for the K effective. Okay, so once we have uh, this uh, procedure, we can also do, um, we can also consider all the other tests. Okay, so the only thing is that we have to remind that there are, there could be also different values of, uh, um, of cycles. Uh, I mean, uh, not for uh, horizontal cyclic and uh, uh, frequency dependence. Uh, but we have uh, different cycles for the repeated cyclic, uh, which have uh, uh, which has uh, actually ten cycles. So what we can do is uh, uh, actually an Excel um, an Excel table. So rubber bearing. Okay. Uh, so let's consider all the files. I think that the list is okay in order. 
numerical order. Okay, we have uh, before all the frequency dependence uh, and then uh, the horizontal cyclic. Uh, and finally, we have the repeated cyclic. Okay, uh, so the first uh, we have uh, these uh, data. Okay, so in order to store all the uh, all the variables, uh, let's open damping, uh, damping, okay, and the effective stiffness, okay. So damping for the first uh, and. Uh, the effective stiffness. Okay. Okay. Now let's consider the second second test. You see that we get uh, two higher values of damping. We have again three cycles. Uh, what about the frequency? The frequency is uh, 0.4, you see, and this is uh, still a frequency dependence. So we are increasing the, uh, the frequency value. So let's have a look at the, uh, once again, the, the least, uh, the repeated cyclic is the last one. So I think that we can do uh, just very easily the analysis for all the tests which have uh, this, uh, which have actually three cycles, uh, everything but the one, uh, the, the last one, in this way. So if uh, we transform this uh, uh, variable in a loop, for instance, for if uh, which goes from one to, um, we have 14 tests, so 13, because we don't want to consider the last one, and then we set and here then we move everything there okay i think that the frequency has to be stored for all the uh, for all the uh, tests and this is the variable for all the tests frequency is here okay then we want to have okay number of cycles we know that they are three Okay, and then we can, okay, store damping and uh, the effective stiffness for all the cycles and for all the files. I think that we are, uh, we should be, we should be done with this. Okay. You see, we are doing exactly the same procedure for all the tests. Uh, okay, then uh, we have to, uh, this, this, this figure doesn't make sense, uh, but uh, maybe we have, we have uh, actually all the, all the plots for all the signals and so on. So we can just close everything. We are just interested in numerical values now. So you see now the, um, we have also five cycles uh, here. Uh, the, uh, these, uh, uh, these tests are five cycle tests. Okay, uh, I didn't know that. So it's better, you see uh, the, uh, so maybe we can do also for all the tests because uh, the, uh, the number of columns is automatically um, updated. Let's do also the, the final one. Yes. And you see that the uh, the final one with ten cycles uh, uh, can actually uh, recognize uh, all the all the cycles uh, which are individually uh, individually individually analyzed. This is three. 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 This is five. This is five. Okay. Yes, you have also tests with five with five cycles. Okay, so we have also all the values uh, for frequency. And uh, you see that we have uh, approximately the same frequency value for 
uh, for the tests which have uh, uh, which are horizontal cyclic, uh, which are actually one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, these are approximately uh, have the same approximately the same frequency, and the other one, uh, the first, have uh, actually increasing values of frequency. Okay. So once we have these, uh, we can actually uh, try to perform some uh, uh, some analysis. Uh, okay, this now is very uh, uh, what we were doing before is better to is already done by by the program. Okay, these are values for damping. Okay, let's consider this. Okay, let's erase uh, all the zeros. Uh, okay. So you see that uh, the approximately the damping uh, uh, goes from seven to eight point five percent. So this is a, a low damping rubber bearing uh, for all the tests, and. Uh, we can have exactly the same for K effective. And we go here, this is damping ratio. And then we have effective stiffness. Okay, and then we erase just zero numerical values. Okay. So what we can do is just to see if there is a, a sort of um, dependency on the frequency. So what we can do is uh, to try to plot to see if uh, uh, we get something, uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, which makes sense. The vector of frequency over the damping ratio. Okay, that is not uh, something good uh, as, uh, points. Hmm. Okay, we have zero values because uh, at some location that we have we have different values of uh, uh, cycles. As we increase the frequency, we can see that there is uh, averagely, obviously, an increase in value of damping uh, up to an average value of 8%. Okay, it is uh, quite uh, widespread, but uh, there is no uh, a single trend that which can be detected. But actually, what we can uh, what we can do is just to consider maybe the first, the very first uh, um, tests, which actually are from the first to the um, to the eighth. Let's try to do this because. Uh, those tests are actually uh, the one related to the frequency dependence. So from one to eight, and then we have one to eight, but with all the columns. Yeah, now uh, everything looks a little bit more, um, I mean, specific. There is actually this increasing in damping as the uh, frequency increases. So this is, uh, the main, uh, actually, the main uh, dependence uh, which can be observed. Okay. Let's have a look at also the uh, damping for the um, uh, for the deformation, and for the deformation we have uh, from nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, so five. Okay. So let's consider from uh, nine to thirteen. 9 and 13. Okay, but not frequency because the frequency is always the same, but we should also store the maximum displacement, but we don't have it, I think. Okay, I just copied this. Um, I think that we have to also to store the maximum displacement. Okay. Okay. We have to pay attention on this because uh, if we set here 
Uh, if we store for all the tests the maximum displacement, uh, here the frequency should uh, also be updated uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the index uh, for the maximum displacement. And then I think we are done. Uh, okay. Now everything is exactly like before, but we have also the, uh, all the values of displacement. Okay. So let's have a look at Okay, uh, so nine to 13. And then nine to 13, but D max. Okay, so in this way, with the horizontal cyclic tests, we are uh, investigating the dependency uh, of the uh, damping with respect to the maximum displacement, uh, so the shear, uh, the shear strain. Okay, and again, if uh, um, it's, uh, it looks like uh, having a, a the, an increasing damping uh, with respect to the uh, lateral deformation of the bearing, uh, slightly increasing, okay. But uh, we have different, co uh, different colors, which means the uh, different behaviors for all the tests. And then what I want you to consider is uh, also the degradation uh, after, uh, during the repeated cyclic tests. Uh, so let's have a look at the final, um, for instance, uh, the bar plot for the damping of the last row and, and all the cycles, which is the, uh, the repeated cyclic test. So you see there is, it starts from uh, approximately 0.2 uh, 8.3 of damping, and then it starts decreasing. And I think that uh, this is an asymptotic value up to 7.4% uh, of damping. So you see that there is actually a degradation uh, of damping, uh, which is uh, actually uh, not so high. And uh, there should be also for the uh, stiffness, uh, so the K effective. Uh, also here, there is a slight decreasing value of the K effective uh, for multiple cycle, uh, cycles, but again, uh, approximately everything is stable. But uh, we have already um, uh, noticed that this behavior uh, from the initial plot of the force hysteretic loops. So plot D versus force. So you see that uh, all the loops uh, are uh, approximately overlapped. This is uh, for uh, the last test, which is the repeated cyclic tests. Uh, they are approximately overlapped, so there is uh, no uh, significant variation uh, in the mechanical properties. Okay, and uh, I think that uh, we you see that with just a script, uh, which is not so long, we have uh, considered. Uh, um, 14 tests, and we have computed according to the standard code uh, all the, um, for all the tests and for all the cycles, uh, the uh, mechanical properties for rubber bearings, uh, which, are, uh, which are actually damping ratio and effective stiffness. What we have to do is uh, this exactly the same for also lead rubber bearings uh, and then uh, for curved surface sliders. Um, the tests for curved surface sliders uh, are actually tests uh, for uh, not uh, related to the not related to um, the European standard code, but they are from research because actually um, I want you to uh, to notice the actual behavior of the friction coefficient with respect to sliding velocity and the vertical load. So that uh, so I've uh, I've chosen. Uh, a particular prototype of the curved surface slider um, uh, with which uh, we, have a pr uh, we have performed a, a high number of tests uh, so that you are able also to see uh, the behavior of uh, those devices uh, when subjected to different combination of velocity and vertical loads. Okay, so um, according to rubber bearings, uh, do you have any questions, something not clear? 
Um, it's not a question actually, but uh, could you please uh, sh share the code on the uh, Dropbox folder? Just yeah, to, sure. To have it. Yes, yeah, thank sure, you. sure, sure, absolutely. Okay, so if uh, there is no question, uh, I think that we can do uh, 15 minutes, or one five minutes uh, uh, of, uh, of break. We can start again uh, at four o'clock for the second part of this uh, numerical laboratory. So uh, you will see that uh, in the second part of the laboratory, uh, everything uh, will be uh, much more, uh, much easier. I mean, uh, because uh, we have already done the, the most, most part of the, of the work. I mean, because uh, the procedure for uh, isolating all the cycles for the tests is exactly the same for, for all the typologies of devices. And uh, uh, we will have just to change the mechanical properties to, to consider for all the typologies. So let's have a 15 minutes break and see you at four o'clock.
Okay, here we are. So we have done everything regarding the rubber bearings. And now we are ready to start with the, the lead rubber bearings. So we, I share my screen and we will start by analyzing actually the lead rubber bearings. So we have just to um, consider some additional uh, equations, but just for uh, the uh, new mechanical properties that we have to compute which are uh, different with respect to the uh, rubber bearing, the pure rubber bearings. Um, I just remind you that according to the standard code of the, um, the European standard code, the N15129, the uh, testing protocol is exactly the same between the two typologies of devices. Actually, uh, the rubber bearings and the lead rubber bearings. And uh, we have seen that there is only one difference which is actually the uh, set of quantity that we have to consider. So I just start with the PowerPoint. And then we will consider now what we have to compute for lead rubber bearings. Okay, so lead rubber bearings means that we have a rubber bearing with a lead core, a lead dissipative core, which provides the hysteresis, a much higher dissipative area and the hysteresis. So everything can be associated to a bilinear hysteretic, hysteretic rule. And consequently, what we get as experimental behavior in terms of a force displacement loop is something like will be something like this. Okay, uh, much more symmetric than what uh, than uh, what I have drawn, but um, there are two uh, new mechanical properties. which have to be, to be computed according to the standard code, which is uh, K2 and QD, okay? And the K2 is uh, the post yield stiffness. Whereas QD, is actually the strength, the initial strength, let's call it, initial strength. Okay, and actually QD is related to these points. So the force points with the zero displacement. So at the zero, uh, at undeformed configuration of the bearing, Whereas K2 is related to the post yield stiffness. So this means the uh, tangent stiffness actually for uh, the um, plastic branch of the hysteresis loop. But uh, as you may understand, the standard code should provide actually a standardized procedure to compute K2 because otherwise, uh, uh, we have, uh, we will have uh, always, in any case, uh, uh, highly nonlinear and continuous uh, and curvilinear hysteresis loops. So we have a tangent stiffness which varies point by point. So the uh, standard code has provided a general procedure for the computation of the, um, uh, the post stiffness, and it is defined according to the following uh, definition. K2. So in terms of post yield stiffness uh, is the uh, second stiffness uh, between two points. The first point uh, is uh, defined at the maximum displacement. And the second point with the relative, I mean, with the relative value of force. And the second point uh, is uh, related to a displacement value, which is uh, actually 50%, uh, it has the, um, 
half, exactly half of the maximum displacement, 0.5 times the max. And the correspondent value of uh, display uh, of the force. So this linear branch, the slope of this linear branch is actually k2. Okay, so this means that we have two individual values for k2. one related to the positive branch of forces and one related to the negative one. Okay, so for each cycle, we will compute the first value, the second value, and then we will compute also the average. Okay, so we will have two individual values for a per cycle plus one because we will compute the average value for uh, for the couple of values. Uh, sorry, again, what's the, uh, oh, this is OS D max, the, the one, the point. No, uh, the, the... 0.5. So the, 0.5, oh yeah, sorry, uh, sorry. Sorry for the. <laughs> no, no, my bad, my bad, I couldn't hear it. Yeah, uh, let's say uh, instead of 0.5, uh, let's say uh, divided by two. Okay, and also here we have minus the max. And here we have minus the max divided by two. Okay. And then the uh, initial strength, okay, it is uh, just the force value related to uh, the uh, zero displacement uh, point. Okay. And uh, also for QD, uh, this is uh, not a straightforward definition uh, because uh, at the zero displacement point, when we consider just a single cycle, uh, this is what generally happens. Uh, I just change color. Okay, if we could uh, try to enlarge the figure just for you to, to better understand. Okay, force displacement, then we compute, we obtain the force displacement. Let's say, uh, let's consider just a single cycle. And we know that uh, also for lead rubber bearings, we have the starting and ending loops uh, and data will be analyzed uh, just without them. So we start automatically from uh, this cycle. And then we have a sort of degradation so maybe we finish here. So what happens uh, for a single cycle is that at the zero displacement, we have uh, three values uh, of force. Okay. Because we have uh, the starting value, which is different, potentially different uh, in comparison to the ending value, because we have the degradation uh, of the mechanical properties uh, during the cycles. Okay, and then we have just the only force value at zero displacement for the uh, for the negative uh, uh, axis of forces, uh, which is just a single value, so there is no doubt about that. Um, okay, so uh, for a single cycle, we can compute for uh, QD three values, uh, but generally uh, we can be associated just one, uh, with one value of uh, initial strength. So maybe we can, okay, in our script, we will store all these three values, but then we will compute also uh, an average value, which is the average between, uh, okay, let's call these one, two, and three. QD average will be the mean between F3 and the mean between F1 and F2. Okay. So this is uh, exactly like uh, considering uh, uh, points one and two, exactly like a one average point. 
Okay, and then we perform the mean between that average point with respect to the third point. Okay, this is just to because generally we computed the mean, an average value for a given quantity, for instance, for Q2, by averaging the values for a single cycle. Here we have three values. So, first of all, we compute an average value for the positive force. And then we have just a single value for the negative force, and then we we perform the mean. And obviously, the mean has to be performed according to positive values. So we have to compute the absolute values for of the of the negative force. So we just consider positive values of forces here. Okay. Um, I think we are done because uh, this is just what we have to uh, what we have to consider for ladder bear bearings, uh, and then uh, the reasoning uh, and the study, the investigation of the dependency with respect to the lateral shear strain uh, rather than the frequency and uh, rather than the cyclic effect will be uh, will be carried out by considering these uh, uh, mechanical properties. Okay, so this is the only difference with respect to, the, uh, to pure uh, rubber bearings. So I go back to MATLAB. Okay, my suggestion is uh, to uh, save as name uh, the uh, this uh, uh, this script so that we uh, we can actually uh, consider different comments uh, for ladder bear bearings. So let's save as, and I just add L LRB analysis uh, v1 save okay uh, what changes here is also the number of uh, the name of the folder which is lrb okay and again uh, now we have uh, the final result of the previous uh, script uh, which considers actually uh, the whole set of uh, of tests uh, but again, uh, it's, it is better to consider just one test at the beginning. Uh, so I just want to consider uh, one file. Uh, let's check if everything works. Uh, and finally, we will consider one by one uh, the whole set of tests. Okay. So uh, by uh, changing the name of folder, the script automatically uh, uh, is automatically able to consider the new tests. Uh, okay, the definition of the uh, time interval is exactly the same. Uh, the velocity, again, is the same. Maximum displacement, okay. Uh, maximum velocity, okay. And the frequency, okay. This is exactly the uh, same uh, as, as before. Uh, zero points, uh, no problem. Everything is uh, exactly as before. Uh, number of cycle uh, again. Uh, I mean, uh, no changing in this. Uh, what changes is obviously what is uh, computed uh, in all the cycles. Okay. So what I want you to see is uh, uh, at the beginning uh, I just uh, write here return and. Uh, run the uh, the first file a return just stops the script at that location so what i've done at this location we, um, before this location is just the upload of the file because i want you to check the uh, graphical representation of these series loops for this particular device so plot the d and force so you see that now we have uh, much more hysteresis uh, due to the uh, lead core. Okay, so there is a, a much higher area. So we are expecting to find uh, uh, the um, equivalent viscous damping values uh, for all the cycles and for all the tests. So uh, much higher than uh, seven, seven uh, or eight percent that uh, we have find uh, we, we have found uh, in um, in the previous uh, device. Because just because of the effect of lead core uh, is to provide much higher uh, hysteresis area and the much uh, more um, uh, dissipative capacities to the device itself. Okay, so again, uh, you see that there is uh, the uh, 
uh, that there were no starting and ending loops uh, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, notice this uh, simply because uh, the starting and ending loops uh, um, they don't achieve uh, uh, the maximum displacement but they achieve um, uh, a lower value of displacements uh, and all the cycles uh, which are represented here goes uh, they go up to the maximum displacement of the test so there is no internal uh, internal cycles here so these are automatically all the uh, tests that uh, all the cycles that we have to, uh, to consider and let's have a look at the displacement time, sim uh, time series so again, we have uh, three cycles, uh, so we will see also, um, I think that uh, we have uh, three uh, horizontal cyclic tests, uh, three uh, frequency dependence uh, and one uh, um, uh, repeated cyclic. So let's have a look at our, uh, let's remove the return and uh, let's go back to our script. So what we have to consider is uh, okay cycle uh, cycle by cycle not the effective uh, uh, stiffness uh, uh, okay the damping uh, okay uh, we can uh, it is not recommended by the uh, standard code but we we want to know the damping uh, just uh, for sake of comparison uh, with the uh, with the previous uh, device and actually the damping is something which is directly related to design and to fast design rules as we will see on friday so it is better to to compute also damping okay um we need to compute a number of quantities first let's start from qd which seems to be the easiest one why well just because QD is uh, the force value, okay, at the uh, um, at the, a number of locations, but we can notice that the locations where we have uh, the um, QD values are 0.1 and 0.2, and 0.1 and 0.2 are actually the starting and the ending points of the cycle. Okay, so if we want to um, to write here to, to draw actually the uh, displacement signal of the single of the single cycle we have something like this this is point 0.1 and this is point 0.2 so the starting and the ending points uh, of the loop of the single loop and what about point 0.3 point 0.3 is uh, a point within the cycle with the zero displacement. So it is exactly this point. Okay. So um, let's consider, let's write a new expression in MATLAB, which actually stores QD as F1 then we can consider F3 and then F2. And then we will compute one over two times F3 and one over two plus one over two F1 plus F2. Okay, so we will have one, two, three, and four components for uh, actually for each cycle. So it is uh, actually a huge uh, matrix. So we uh, we should uh, be able to um, to pay attention on this because uh, actually that if uh, we want then to have a single script which considers uh, all the cycles for all the tests. Uh, we should be able to provide just, uh, um, I mean, uh, a quantity which is uh, which provides a single value of uh, um, a single value for all the cycles uh, and for all the tests, so that we get a matrix. Uh, 
Uh, in MATLAB, uh, we have uh, also multi-dimensions uh, uh, matrices, uh, but uh, they are quite hard to consider. So they, they could lead to, uh, to mistakes. And then uh, uh, at the end, when you have to, um, to carry out some uh, investigations into numerical results. So I think that we can compute the different, uh, uh, different variables. Uh, F1, F3, and uh, F2, and then uh, to compute the QD as uh, the, uh, the average one, okay? So let's consider now this. Okay, so uh, K-effective uh, EDC, okay, uh, is again, We need the EDC for the computation of damping, and we want to know which is actually the equivalent viscous damping for this device. So now we know all the starting and ending indices for this single loop, which are these ones. So if the starting index is zero point at two times i, minus one and the ending is uh, at uh, two times i plus one the intermediate point uh, which is related to actually the the third value of force uh, is equal to the zero point at two times i okay so let's consider f1 f1 will be the f value at the first index of the cycle, okay? F2, it is uh, at the end of the cycle, so uh, plus one. And then we have F3, which is the negative value, which is F at the intermediate point of the cycle, which is uh, twice i, and that's it. And then QD can be computed as the average value, so uh, 0, uh, 0.5 times. Um, we have F3, and uh, let's say absolute value of F3, so that uh, we are forgetting the, uh, the symbol plus 0.5 times F1 plus F2, okay? So we have, in this way, we store all the variables, F1, F2, F3, and QD. Um, we have just to pay attention on the indexes in order to for this script to be uh, generalized for also for the the uh, whole set of tests we have uh, exactly to use the same indexes uh, like the damping and so on so we uh, just consider the same indices also here and uh, we have to remember also the qd but also internally the equation of QD. Okay, so in this way, we have considered the, um, let's say the initial strength for the device. Now we have to look at the um, uh, second stiffness between 50% uh, and 100% of the maximum displacement for both the branches, the positive one and the negative one. Okay, once we have this, uh, we should uh, find the index according to which we have 50% uh, uh, of the maximum displacement. So um, if we go back here, okay, just to, uh, to provide some useful uh, procedure, we need to know uh, what is the uh, time instant which is related to uh, the max over two, okay? And uh, uh, in order to do this, uh, we can do 
exactly the following. If we consider the single cycle in terms of uh, displacement over time, we have something like this. Okay. And um, what we need is actually this point and this point. Okay. So let's consider a horizontal line, which is actually related to 50% of the maximum displacement, positive and negative. Okay. The intersection point be, uh, between uh, this dashed line and uh, the signal of displacements is, are actually two, and the same for the negative value. Okay. And so, uh, which are actually the points that we need? So we, uh, regarding the positive value of displacements, uh, which is actually this first uh, uh, branch uh, of the signal, do we have to use the first uh, or the second? Well, actually we need to use uh, the first because it is related to a positive value of uh, force. So this is the one that we have to use. And then, by looking at the negative values of displacements, do we have to use the first, the first or the second? So again, the first, because it is relative to uh, a negative value of force. Okay, because otherwise the other ones are this point and this point. Okay. So according to this definition, we need to know a procedure for the computation of this point and this point. Okay, in MATLAB, there is a, a, a command which is very useful, which is find. Uh, actually find helps to uh, determine the indexes of a given vector uh, related to of all the components of a given vector with uh, a given um, actually characteristic. So we can say that um, let's call uh, an index uh, i at uh, uh, 50 d. i 50 d, which is the uh, p positive. Uh, we can say find D of the single cycle, obviously, uh, higher than or equal to 0.5 times D max. Uh, D max, uh, uh, okay, let's say uh, just to be uh, very precise, uh, maximum of the C. Okay. So according to this definition, uh, what happens is that MATLAB provides a, a number of components uh, which contain uh, actually the indexes uh, where we have the displacement higher than 50% uh, of the maximum value, which are actually related to all these points, okay? Among these points, uh, we just did the first, okay? So what we need is just to redefine I 50% of D positive. So I 50 D positive, just equal to itself at the first component. Okay. So in this way, we are just selecting a single point, which is actually this, uh, the first point of the selection uh, of uh, indexes, uh, which provides points high uh, displacements higher than 50% of the maximum value. And uh, we can do exactly the same for the minimum one. We have just to pay attention on the symbols. So the um, I50D minus M, find the um, D 
displacement signal of the single uh, cycle lower than or equal to minus 50% of the uh, maximum displacement. Or we can say maybe 50% uh, of the minimum. This is exactly the same. Okay, we get exactly the same uh, the same uh, result since we are applying uh, tests uh, with the um, symmetric cycles. So the maximum displacement is exactly equal to the minimum, uh, approximately, obviously, because uh, we have uh, many digits. But uh, the uh, the control system of the testing equipment uh, provides a very um, uh, a very good estimation of the reference signal. And so then we have just to modify these uh, minus and minus. And again, we did just the first number because uh, if we go back to the uh, drawing, uh, with the first expression, uh, we get the set of all these points uh, and we just did the first, okay? Okay, so according to these, uh, we need uh, to uh, compute these, uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, this slope. We need also this point, but it is uh, quite easy to compute. We can say uh, I 100% D positive, and this is find DC equal. We have to uh, we have to type double equal because it is a comparison. Uh, double equal to uh, maximum of the C. And uh, the same for the negative with the minimum. Okay. So in this way, they are exactly equal. So we, can, uh, we could uh, use uh, also just a single value of maximum displacement, but in this way, we are very precise uh, and uh, we use exactly the right value of force uh, that we have uh, at that location. So again, we have, uh, for all the cycles, uh, we have uh, K2 positive, and again, uh, for the height file and for the height cycle. Okay. And we have uh, actually the difference between the force of the cycle at the height 100% the positive and minus uh, the related value at 50%, okay, divided by 0.5 times the max, which is maximum of DC. Okay, and this is K2 in the positive uh, region of the force displacement uh, plot. Let's compute also the uh, negative minus. So it is, we have just to change these uh, uh, indexes. And okay, the maximum displacement is again uh, the same. And then we can consider K2 as the average of the previous uh, quantities. I F I equal to uh, 0 0.5 times and we just sum up the two contribution. Um, okay. Okay, any questions so far? Something not clear? Okay, you see that the the largest amount of work was done in the previous two, in the previous uh, part of this laboratory. Now I think that everything is uh, is done. Let's try to run. 
with the, uh, you see now we are just looking at a single uh, at a single test. This is not so good. This uh, simply because we have just two cycles. We have to check what uh, what is not considered. Okay. Uh, you see, this could happen when we deal with the uh, general um, procedures uh, in data reduction process. Now, everything is different because uh, the signal starts above zero. Okay, so it is a half of a half of a, of a millimeter. And so automatically we are missing the first, uh, the first uh, initial point. And at the same time, uh, no, the, the last one is, uh, is captured because we finish uh, actually uh, slightly uh, above zero. So the best way is, uh, is uh, actually to apply this procedure with uh, the starting and the ending loop. Uh, so otherwise we have to, uh, to correct this, uh, this issue. Um, we can do this. We can try to generalize uh, the overall procedure because maybe uh, the, next, uh, the next test has uh, different behaviors. Okay, so. I think that uh, this is uh, uh, this is right the overall procedure for the zero points, but we can also say that uh, if uh, the display the first value of displacement uh, is uh, greater than zero, then the uh, zero point vector has to start also from one, and then we had all the other points. And okay, uh, and this is just to add the initial point whenever the uh, signal doesn't start from a positive uh, uh, from a positive uh, value. Let's say also greater than or equal to. Okay, uh, the same has to be done also for the end, the ending point. So. So if D and is uh, um, actually lower than or equal to zero, we have to add also the uh, ending point. So the uh, length of D. Okay, let's see if it works now. Okay, now we have three cycles, but let's have a look at this. Okay, you see here uh, the number, uh, the last value of displacement is positive. Uh, so uh, the ordinary uh, procedure is applied because uh, the point is uh, already catched by the procedure. But at the beginning, uh, we start with uh, a slightly positive. Uh, Value, so this means that this point would not be captured by the uh, by our previous procedure, and we need actually to add uh, to manually add this point, uh, and automatically is done uh, with this check. Okay. Um, let's have a look at this figure, uh, the 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 one related to damping. You see the damping ratio is actually about 22%. Okay, so much higher than the 8% that we got for the rubber bearing. And these are ordinary values for damping ratios for lead rubber bearings, much even larger because generally for rubber bearings, also 30% can be achieved. Um, so this is a commonly uh, a commonly adopted value also for design for such a typology of the of isolators. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the uh, stiffnesses. So the stiffness here is uh, um, the stiffness negative is not something is something correct. So that we have to check these computations. 
and uh, also I think this is because positive okay then negative is not is not right so we have to check these uh, these computations so maybe there is uh, the symbols of the symbol of some of them so we have to consider that they are um, negative values so uh, I think that we have to consider uh, the absolute value of these. Okay. Let's check. K2. Okay, so maybe now uh, it works. Uh, you see, there is there should not be uh, so much difference between the K2 uh, positive and the K2 uh, negative. So we have 1000 uh, and here 968. Uh, then we have uh, um, 966 uh, and uh, 1000. So it starts increasing. Okay, so approximately 1000 the average. Okay, it looks like uh, approximately constant uh, with respect to the cycles. Uh, so uh, if we plot a bar plot uh, of K2, which is actually the average, uh, yeah, you see approximately average, uh, uh, average value, a constant value equal to 1000 for all the cycles. And the same uh, can be done also for QD, for the initial strength. Here we have actually a decreasing value. Okay, and uh, we switch from 170 approximately, yes, to 158. Okay, 10, 12, uh, 12 kilonewtons uh, over, yeah, 6%, something like that. Not so much. Okay, I think that now we are able to run all the tests. Um, let's go to the size of the list of files uh, in terms of rows. Comma one stands for uh, the size, uh, the first size of the variable, which is uh, the number of rows. And I think that now we should find. Uh, exactly the whole set of uh, results for the, all the tests. Okay, something here uh, happens. Okay. So uh, dimensions of array being concatenated are not consistent. Yeah, because we need semicomma. You see that. You see that these in this uh, file, the repeated cyclic, just the last one, uh, we have found uh, um, a case where the uh, displacement value at the end is negative. Uh, let's check. Uh, let's plot also the grid. If you check the grid, yes. Uh, the signal doesn't go beyond the zero, but maybe it is nearby zero. We have to enlarge the picture. Okay, we have we are below zero. So automatically, this point is not captured by our procedure because uh, we don't pass uh, towards zero um, in order to have uh, the product between the two values of displacement negative, minor minor than zero. So we, uh, what, there was a mistake here because uh, uh, ZP, uh, zero, uh, zero points the vector is a vertical, uh, is a column vector. And uh, with the space here, uh, it tries to uh, add the length of D in a, in a second column, but uh, this is just a, a single column vector. So we need to, uh, to write a semi-comma um, semi here. Now everything should work. Okay. Now, uh, okay, this this plot uh, doesn't make sense because uh, it was uh, done for uh, for a single test. You see that now the also the final uh, the final point is uh, catched, and so we have actually ten cycles, 
and then okay then we have the whole set of results so now we go back to uh, excel okay so indexes and uh, here lead rubber bearings So we have uh, um, QD, which is uh, initial strength. Let's go back to our script. Uh, let's go to the workspace uh, and check the average value for the initial strength. So here for these tests that I provided, uh, we have uh, actually three cycles uh, for all uh, for both the horizontal cyclic and the frequency dependent uh, tests, and we have ten cycles for uh, the uh, cyclic test, the repeated cyclic. So we have this. Okay. We can just remove uh, a number of digits, just to see. The initial strength try, uh, is approximately 200, averagely 200, uh, goes from uh, 150 and 260, approximately. So averagely is uh, 200. And then we have K2, so the post yield stiffness. And we go back we check the K2, which is the average value of stiffness, uh, averagely 1,000. Okay. Then I will provide also this Excel file uh, in order for you to, uh, to check the numerical results. Uh, we can also uh, consider the damping equivalent visco viscose damping ratio. Okay. And the damping C. Okay. Okay, let's consider percentages. You see that Okay, for the 10 cycle test, uh, the repeated cyclic, uh, we switch from the initial value, which is 21%, uh, and it decreases up to 18.6%. So we have a, an actual degradation of uh, the mechanical properties. What we can see is that the, um, on the other end, the uh, positive stiffness, uh, I think that it increases. Uh, uh, and uh, can be observed, this behavior can be observed also for all the other tests. Averagely, yeah, in this case, just in this case, also in this case, there is a, uh, an increase and then, okay, this is approximately constant and also these. Let's have a look at the graphs for these. Um, if we want to consider uh, just a plot of these, uh, let's, consider a plot of uh, one to 10, which is the number of uh, cycles uh, and uh, the damping, for instance, uh, um, I have to obviously to consider points. Okay, you see that uh, there is actually a decreasing value of uh, damping uh, and uh, yeah, there is a little bit of disper dispersion for the first three cycles so for all the um, different uh, motions that we have applied. And then there is, you see uh, this uh, multi-cyclic test, which were, yeah, otherwise uh, you will find a single test. You see the trend, the overall trend is uh, approximately uh, parallel one to each other. And uh, we still have uh, a decreasing value of damping as uh, we increase the number of cycles. Let's have a look at also the um, K2 values. Yeah, you see that uh, for both the uh, three cycles and the 10 cycle tests, 
we have an increase in value, a slightly increase in value of uh, uh, this second uh, um, deposited stiffness, I mean. Okay, just in this case, uh, we have uh, a much higher uh, increase uh, in the initial stiffness. Uh, okay, let's just consider, just to be sure that we have done uh, properly the definition of the, um, of just for a single test. Uh, for uh, for the uh, the stiffness, the K two stiffness. Uh, so we want to consider, for instance, the figure of uh, uh, the single test in terms of force displacement loop, the C and F C. Hold all, and then I want to uh, consider, I think these uh, and the indexes uh, for 50% of displacement positive and 100% uh, positive and the same also for the force. Okay, and we do exactly the same for the minimum. just to see if the indices are fine. Let's see. Okay, uh, this is done. Okay. You see uh, what is uh, the main problem is that uh, the uh, maximum displacement uh, is not related to the maximum force. So the, uh, we uh, actually find uh, this slope, uh, which is not actually aligned with respect to the tangent stiffness that we expect from this graph. And uh, also, okay, here there is the, the displacements also. Uh, so this is the main uh, reason why we have uh, this issue. So what we can do here is uh, to try to correct, uh, because uh, actually the, the real slope uh, should be uh, actually corrected to this one uh, related to the maximum force. So what we can do is uh, to correct uh, these two indices uh, uh, related not to uh, the uh, maximum displacement, but uh, related to the maximum force and the minimum force. So let's correct these uh, to these uh, and also these to these. So let's check now. Okay, now it looks uh, uh, it, it looks better. At least uh, this slope is uh, actually the slope related to uh, the tangent slope uh, of the uh, post yield branch. Okay, and uh, uh, it is uh, quite better for the definition of the uh, of the post yield stiffness. So now let's consider these uh, also for the remaining tests. Okay. So we have, now we can again try to consider the tests in terms of stiffness. You see now we have approximately constant value of, uh, uh, okay, here slightly decreasing, uh, here approximately constant, here slightly increasing, uh, but uh, generally we, we can say that this doesn't change uh, too much, okay? And let's update also the numerical values for the um, Excel file. Uh, this is for K2, okay. Okay, my suggestion, uh, you see that uh, there, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have to trust in uh, what we find uh, uh, immediately, but we have uh, always to check if uh, we are doing right. Uh, whenever you find something which is uh, uh, actually tricky to model uh, and to, uh, to model in, uh, within MATLAB, uh, and uh, that's something as uh, actually a graphical representation, uh, my suggestion is always to check 
if uh, uh, the graphical representation that you are expecting uh, is actually what is computed by the code. Uh, and you see the um, we have actually applied uh, what is ruled by the code, but uh, the code uh, assumes automatically assumes that the uh, slope uh, of the uh, between the 100% and 50% of displacement, uh, positive and negative, uh, uh, is uh, actually uh, related to the tangent stiffness of the uh, post yield branch. But actually, uh, it could be also that uh, you have uh, a, a maximum displacement uh, which is not related to the maximum force. So you get uh, a slope which is not actually what uh, uh, could be uh, considered as opposed to yield stiffness. So you have to correct uh, the actual formula. I think that uh, we have we can actually uh, consider some other issues. Uh, for instance, we have uh, the first three. Um, tests uh, which are the frequency dependence so we uh, test uh, so we can consider for instance uh, the dependency let's uh, consider a bar plot uh, uh, no, not a bar plot but a plot a simple plot of a frequency with respect to c but for just the first three tests Okay, uh, so uh, this is uh, the damping. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, this is for uh, three, uh, just a single, a single test. We have to pay attention to this. Uh, we have to consider just the first three uh, tests, but with all the um, all the cycles. Okay. So you see there is, uh, uh, for all the cycles, uh, a little bit of decreasing trend, even though uh, I think it would be considered as constant for the damping. Then we can consider also the dependency of the K2 with respect to the frequency. And uh, it looks like uh, if we consider an increasing value of frequency, also the, uh, the positive stiffness starts to increase. And also, if we consider the initial strength, QD, also in this case, if we go faster in motion, we get a higher value of uh, uh, initial strength for the lead core. OK, so now let's have a look at the uh, other three tests, which are the fourth and the sixth for the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, but related to the uh, shear strain dependency, so T max. And uh, um, again, uh, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth tests uh, for, for, uh, for instance, uh, the, initial, uh, the initial strength. And again, uh, as we apply a larger displacements, uh, we have an increase in value of uh, uh, the, initial, uh, uh, the initial strength. Approximately constant, uh, uh, approximately constant uh, value of uh, the positive stiffness. This is interesting. So we have a variation of uh, uh, positive stiffness uh, just whenever we uh, change the frequency content of the input, uh, but we will have uh, a constant value of a positive stiffness whenever we uh, fix uh, actually the frequency and uh, we change the uh, displacement demand of the test. And regarding the, uh, the damping, uh, yeah, approximately, yeah, slightly decreasing uh, uh, as in the previous cases, uh, but uh, uh, approximately equal to 20% for this device. Okay, so you see, uh, once you have uh, a procedure which uh, allows you to have uh, the computation of all the quantities that the, which are required by the standard code, uh, you can then, with all the results, uh, uh, we can do some reasoning uh, and some uh, um, investigations uh, on the behavior of the device uh, with respect to frequency, with respect to the maximum displacement, uh, and so on. So there are, are there any questions uh, about lead rubber bearings? 
Okay, so if there is no question for uh, lateral bear bearings, uh, we can end up with this uh, laboratory by considering the final typology of devices, uh, which are actually curved surface sliders. So as I mentioned, uh, I didn't select uh, the uh, tests uh, according to the standard code, uh, the European standard code, uh, simply because I wanted uh, you to consider the actual behavior of a curved surface slider with respect to cyclic, uh, to cyclic motions uh, by varying uh, the combination of uh, maximum velocity and uh, the applied vertical load. So what I want to, uh, you to consider now in uh, this uh, analysis uh, is actually the dependency of the friction coefficient with respect to the sliding velocity and uh, the vertical load. Let's go back to, um, just very briefly, to the um, PowerPoint so that we can consider just very few equations. So now we will consider curved surface sliders. Okay, so we know that the overall behavior in terms of force displacement loops is something like this. We have a rigid and then plastic with the hardening. Okay, so we are expecting a hysteresis loop like this where we have an approximately vertical uh, branch, unloading branch and loading branch related to the frictional force. And then we have a linear response, uh, an additional linear response related to the recentering behavior due to the, um, the stepwise projection of the vertical load uh, with respect to the uh, spherical surface or surfaces. The actual devices that uh, uh, we will consider in uh, experimental data is uh, uh, actually a double concave surface slider device, which is something like this. It is actually what we have considered yesterday uh, in the video of uh, the tests. So we have two sliding surfaces uh, with, with the same uh, radius of curvature. Okay. But uh, the overall behavior will be uh, exactly like a single curvature. So this means that we will have the uh, effective radius of, uh, radius of curvature. And this, this will rule uh, this uh, slope, uh, which is W over R equivalent. Okay. And the R equivalent for this, B, uh, for this uh, device uh, is uh, something like three meters. And so what we need, uh, now there are some, uh, uh, some procedures that have to be applied. Uh, we need to consider the um, computation of the average uh, friction coefficient per cycle. Which is related to the expression provided by the code, and that we, and then uh, uh, explained uh, by what we have observed yesterday. Uh, so uh, by considering the uh, friction, uh, the hysteresis area as coming from uh, the uh, frictional response only. So this is uh, EDC divided by four times D max and W. Uh, the ID applied vertical load because uh, we just consider the hysteresis uh, as the result of the rectangular, uh, rectangular hysteresis loops. And this maximum force is W uh, times the friction coefficient, uh, and this is D max. Okay. Then another important aspect to compute is uh, another important parameter is actually the uh, average uh, restoring stiffness.
which is actually the stiffness, uh, something similar of K2 uh, with respect to A2, uh, K2, uh, which is actually a post yield stiffness. Uh, okay, here we cannot say yielding point because uh, uh, actually there is a rigid plastic behavior with hardening, uh, and the hardening is actually ruled by the um, the restoring uh, the restoring force, the recentering capability of the device. But uh, especially for uh, for this typology of device. Uh, we have a special procedure to apply uh, according to the standard code, as we have seen uh, yesterday. Uh, we have to compute the average line uh, according to a, um, a least square procedure in order, uh, between 95% uh, and minus 95% uh, of the maximum displacement. So we have uh, something. Let's go back. Okay, let's draw it again. Uh, we have the force displacement loop. Okay, we consider 95% of maximum displacement and the same in the negative direction. And here, obviously, we have something oscillating because it is a recorded signal. Actually, there are two signals are recorded, which is the, the displacement one and the force one. And we have to compute, according to these points, the uh, best fit curve, actually the best fit line. And the slope of that line will be the average restoring stiffness. So for a single cycle, we will have uh, two values. Uh, and again, we will consider the average one. So this is uh, actually what we have to compute. So there are um, actually uh, different procedures uh, to apply. And uh, I just provide uh, you, uh, okay, the, the easiest one is to consider uh, maybe in Excel, there is uh, the, uh, the best fit procedure for the linear, uh, for the linear, um, I mean, uh, for the linear function. But what I can consider is something like this. Uh, in order to compute if we have a number of points uh, and uh, we want to compute this line and we have a number of points in between, Okay, because maybe we have this uh, graphical representation. Okay, this is a much varying uh, signal. The uh, actual equation uh, for this line uh, is uh, something like this. So F as a function of D is equal to alpha times uh, displacement plus beta. OK, so if we consider beta uh, this, uh, uh, this value, and alpha is actually the, the slope. OK. So there is, uh, uh, there is actually a method which uh, actually leads to the least square uh, result, which is uh, called the normal equation. Normal equations method. And this, is, this can be, uh, it is very simple. Uh, and can be uh, applied whenever you have uh, a linear problem, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, the, uh, your uh, graph, uh, your function is, uh, uh, is linear. 
it means that uh, it should be linear with respect to the parameter that you have to compute. I mean, uh, you see here, uh, okay, this is uh, also a line, uh, but uh, you see that uh, all the parameters that we have to, co uh, to compute, which are alpha and beta, they have uh, uh, an exponent which is equal to one. So also a polynomial function uh, is uh, uh, actually linear with respect to the coefficients because we have uh, ax uh, third plus bx second plus c x plus d okay this is actually a nonlinear function with respect to x but this function is uh, represents a linear problem with respect to the parameters because all the parameters are uh, have uh, exponents equal to one okay so also to these uh, polynomial functions even though it is nonlinear can be applied to the normal equations method okay and the method consists in the, this uh, assumption. So actually what we have is a vector of force values and at displacements, okay? So we consider signals as column vectors. And this is very important. So what we assume is that actually the column vector of force is equal to alpha times the column vector of displacement plus beta times a vector of ones, a column vector of ones. So column so let's write it here one one which has exactly this the same number of components of the other signals okay so if you do exactly this we can consider a matrix which is actually D and then the one vector. So that we have F equal to the matrix times the unknown vector, which is alpha and beta. Okay, so finally, in order to get the alpha and beta values, which are actually the one representing the uh, best fit curve, uh, I mean, uh, the best fit line, we have uh, something like this. Alpha and beta equal to the matrix transpose times, uh, I, don't, I don't have any, enough space, just uh, have to erase. Okay, I erase this. Okay, so the matrix transpose times the matrix itself to the minus one, so the inverse, times the matrix transpose times the force vector. And this is the vector alpha and beta. So if we do like this, we get exactly the alpha and beta factors for uh, a given branch, the positive branch. We do exactly the same also for the negative. And finally, we are done because we are interested just in uh, the alpha uh, because this is uh, actually the stiffness the uh, restoring stiffness, okay? So the alpha value is uh, K restoring 
this is what we are looking at. Okay, so let's try to do this. Okay. So let's go to MATLAB. Um, let's save as the uh, the script. We have to change again the name of the folder. Okay. Since we are going to um, actually to do some reasoning uh, about the changing values of friction coefficient with respect to the velocity let's store also the maximum value of velocity so i just have to consider the uh, the index of the file also for the maximum velocity okay there is also the frequency no problem uh, we need uh, we always need the zero points and now we have uh, it is updated with respect to the uh, initial value and final value of displacement if it is positive or negative uh, should be everything okay so um, up to here everything is okay uh, we still need the computation of the damping the equivalent fiscal damping ratio because we want to see actually if uh, uh, the, the value of the damping for uh, also for this typology of device and uh, once we have computed the edc value we can compute the average friction coefficient so mu uh, is uh, actually the friction coefficient and we have to store it with respect to the height file and the height um, cycle this is equal to uh, EDC divided by four times uh, the maximum displacement of the cycle uh, times uh, the vertical load. And that's it. OK, so in this way, we have computed uh, uh, the um, average friction coefficient per cycle according to for, for all the single cycles. Uh, uh, and uh, if we have uh, tests with the three cycles, so we have just to compute the average for the average uh, among three cycles. And uh, now we want to compute these uh, just for one test. And uh, uh, let's go for, okay. Uh, all this part, I think uh, is useless for us because we need uh, actually other uh, other stuff to consider the restoring stiffness. So what we need uh, now is uh, to consider portions of the stiffness loops between uh, minus 95% and plus 95% of Dmax. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that If we look at the, the um, uh, I mean, uh, the signal of displacement, okay, we have 95% of maximum displacement and minus 95% of maximum displacement. So this means that these line is related to these and this portion okay whereas the negative is related to this portion so this is positive and this is negative Okay, so I think that uh, we need uh, four points. We have to define these four points, the points where we have uh, actually 95, approximately 95% uh, of maximum displacement. Once we have them, 
we know that all the points for the positive uh, branch uh, will be from uh, the first point of the signal and uh, the uh, first point of 95%, uh, and then from the first point of minus 95% and the ending point of the signal. Okay, and the other is uh, uh, approximately the same. So let's go back to MATLAB. So we need uh, actually to define uh, uh, index positive, uh, find the uh, displacement for just one, uh, one cycle uh, higher than or equal to uh, 0.95 uh, times maximum displacement of the cycle. And then the, uh, these, uh, this vector contains uh, all the components uh, of displacement signals, uh, which is uh, actually higher than 95% of the peak uh, displacement, uh, but we need just the first uh, and the last points uh, of this set. So EP, so the index, uh, the I uh, at positive P, IP is equal to IP first and end value. Okay, so in this way, we have found uh, actually the first two points. Then we do exactly the same for the negative. So minus, and that this is lower than or equal to minus 95% of maximum displacement. This is called I minus. And I minus again should be just equal to the set of the first and the last point. Okay, so now we have to compute actually the um, uh, restoring stiffness uh, according to, uh, we will try to do also from the uh, graphical point of view, we will check if everything is okay. So le um, let's consider the set of points uh, for the positive branch of the hysteresis loop. So this means uh, that we have uh, index uh, positive uh, equal to from one to uh, I positive one and from I minus two to length Okay, so in this way, we are, this is the expression which leads to the definition of this branch. So from the first value to the first index, uh, which exceeds 95% of the max, and from the second point, which exceeds uh, uh, minus 95% of the max uh, to the length uh, of the signal. But the length of the signal, maybe there is a mistake of, uh, uh, Maybe this is a mistake. Um, we have to consider the final point, uh, which is actually, uh, let's consider this one. No, I think that this is good. No, that should be, that should be good. Okay, because we start from one. Okay, and then we have to do the same for uh, in the, negative minus equal to, I think that we are done with this, uh, IP2 toward uh, I minus one, and that's it. Okay. So force restoring plus equal to force of the cycle at the in the plus and the same for minus. And then we compute also the restoring plus. We have DC at the in the plus. And then we have the same for minus. 
Okay, now we have everything for the computation of uh, this uh, expression. Okay, because the uh, the matrix will be actually a two column matrix. The first column will be the uh, uh, actually the restoring plus and minus differently, and then just a, um, a unit value of components of vector for the second column. So let's consider now the matrix, uh, matrix plus, let's consider so that he, he, everything is individual. Matrix plus is, uh, uh, okay, the residual plus, uh, and uh, once we have length, the residual plus and the one. Okay, that's it, because we have uh, um, parameters plus equal to inverse of math plus transpose times math plus times math transpose plus transpose times F residual plus okay and then the same for minus i just have to consider minus 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 and minus okay so finally i need the restoring stiffness which is, which is k res and it will be for i l and for the i cycle and this will be the uh, average value 0.5 times the two values par m1 i mean par plus plus par minus. The first parameter is alpha, as we have seen here. The first parameter, uh, which is uh, actually the, the one I've written before this expression, uh, was alpha and beta. The first parameter is alpha, the second parameter is beta. We are interested in alpha, which is directly the uh, k-restoring. OK. Um, I need to check these all these computations because uh, there are a lot of computations here. Uh, we have to check if uh, actually these uh, are um, the proper definitions of the um, uh, of the restoring uh, branches uh, the, uh, according to the least square procedure. Let's comment all the uh, previous figures because I just want to highlight that and think is. It is done. Let's comment also this. Okay, this plus actually, um, okay, we don't need this. Okay. Let us plot uh, the indexes for uh, I plus, right? Yes. Okay. And I plus times parameter plus one plus parameter plus two. And the same for minus. Okay, let's check it for just a single test. Okay, we have commented this, uh, CSS, CSS. Okay, there is a mistake. This is, uh, uh, this is normal and define function. Uh, okay, I F. This is T, uh, F, okay, uh, I file, yes, this is right. I think uh, we are done. 
matrix is singular, so there is something uh, something which doesn't work. So you see, uh, data processing uh, is generally something which uh, is iterative <laughs> whenever there is a mistake. Okay, so there is a problem here. So y minus 95% of, okay, greater than 95% and minus, okay. Because this is what? Empty. Plot DC. What is the problem? Ah, uh, yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, uh, I know that uh, the reason why uh, this doesn't work because there is just a test with the uh, with the um, a triangular waveform, and obviously this doesn't work uh, because of the initial points, maybe. Uh, so let's check. Uh, Okay, let's start again. This is actually the test. Close all, I think. No, this is for uh, a 10, okay. Here we have, uh, this is a difference. So here we have uh, uh, also the starting and the ending loop. So we have to actually to consider uh, the very first, uh, uh, the very first zero value. So let's uh, modify this. And then we, have, uh, we will have to remove uh, also the, um, uh, the files uh, with uh, actually the triangular, uh, the triangular waveform because uh, these uh, are procedures for um, the sinusoidal. Um, so we have just to, to do a little variation here we don't want to start from two, maybe, because uh, the zero point, uh, let's do it this. Let's check which points uh, are highlighted. Okay, you see that there are, the problem is that there are a number of points also here, and there are also a number of points also here, okay? So we just need to start from here. So the uh, I think that the easiest way is uh, not to consider the zero point procedure from two to the length of D, but we have to start from, uh, um, let's consider this, I don't know, I mean, I, uh, minimum, uh, which is uh, which are indexes uh, with the minimum displacement on one centimeter, so let's say, equal to uh, absolute uh, find absolute of d greater than or equal to 0.01, and we go from i my minimum one and to I minimum two, uh, sorry, and so that we just exclude the, the final uh, the final portions. Okay, almost done because here we still have something like this. So let's go. Uh, now we should avoid this, okay which are checks just whenever we, we don't have the starting and the ending loops. Okay, now we have all the, uh, all the cycles, okay, without the starting and the ending loop. Okay, now uh, it should work. Okay. Let's check the numerical values because uh, this 10 to the fourth uh, is uh, something which is not uh, that much good. Okay. 
So now all the cycles are fine. What we have to compute is actually the parameters and let's check the parameters. So parameters are these ones and they look actually uh, good. So I think this, uh, this will be, um, oh yeah, I see. So the, uh, this is just a graphical representation because this uh, should not be D, but uh, uh, DC of, yes, of the indexes because uh, we have uh, plotted uh, actually uh, indexes values, uh, which are uh, very high numbers. Let's see if uh, now it works. Uh, maybe, okay, at least uh, there is uh, something different. Okay, I, this is a problem for uh, superposition of a plot. I don't know why it takes, uh, there is a plot which I don't see. Okay, this is. Okay, now I have all the uh, all the cycles, but I think that there is a, there there still be something. Uh, even though the numerical values are fine, you see there. This is just something. Uh, which doesn't work for from the uh, from the numerical uh, from the numerical graphical representation, but we are almost done. So according to DC, uh, I think IP. So let's consider DC. And that's it. Okay. Okay, so it's done. So you see that now we have computed the dashed lines, which are actually the least square lines according to the portions of the hysteresis loops between uh, minus 95 and 95 percent of uh, the maximum displacement for each cycle okay so according to this then we have uh, k recentering which should be uh, somewhere here i don't see it okay here it is we have uh, a value of k recentering uh, uh, for all the for all the ten cycles, and uh, actually, it looks like constant. Uh, we if we just look at a bar plot, yeah, it is constant. Actually, the uh, the vertical load is uh, four hundred and thirty. If we perform a vertical load divided by three, which was the equivalent uh, radius of curvature of the device, uh, we get uh, 143. And uh, the bar plot of uh, decay restoring uh, is uh, something like uh, averagely uh, 156, uh, 153. Okay, it, it is quite similar to that value. Uh, the um, it strongly depends on the effective uh, uh, producing a procedure of the uh, of all these spherical plates. So let's have a look if uh, everything works uh, for the um, for all the tests. I guess that something will happen with the triangular waveform, but let's check. Okay, this is. Uh, the tenth. Let's plot. Yeah, this is still okay. This is the frequency, and we don't look at frequency, so we can uh, 
we can just check ah uh, yeah that this is just because uh, we have uh, also the index for the maximum velocity okay now we have a huge number of figures uh, but you see that all the cycles uh, have the average and obviously whenever we have the first cycle where there is a huge difference a significant difference between the first point and the last point of the cycle the procedure that we have applied here provides the actual best fit curve uh, i mean the best fit line for the portion of the uh, of the loop between minus 95 and plus 95 percent of the maximum displacement Actually, these uh, will lead to a slightly higher value of recentering uh, stiffness with respect to the ordinary one, which is uh, related to a, a continuous branch for uh, the uh, actually for the uh, for the lower portion of the of the loop. You see, everything works properly. Nothing strange. Okay, you see that the experiment, also the experimental behavior of uh, such devices, uh, 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 has actually the shape that we are expecting uh, an approximately vertical branch for the uh, unloading uh, at the loading uh, phases. Uh, due to the frictional forces and we have a UG series. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, friction coefficient value, the variable, uh, no, this is the force, uh, the mu. Okay, so you see there are values uh, 6%, 8%, uh, 13%, so this uh, was uh, actually a uh, non-lubricated material, sliding material. Uh, so this means that uh, we are expecting actually uh, from five to 10 to 15% of friction coefficient. Uh, so here something happened. So maybe this, this was the actually the, uh, the test related to the triangular waveform uh, and that uh, this uh, needs uh, a specific uh, definition uh, of uh, the zero uh, zero displacement values, uh, so but uh, we will find exactly the same uh, similar values of friction coefficient. And uh, what uh, I want to check is also the numerical value of the damping. You see the huge numbers uh, numbers of uh, damping, uh, up to forty percent of damping, uh, just because we have a huge value of uh, uh, energy dissipation due to the frictional behavior. Uh, this is uh, the largest amount of uh, uh, one of the largest amount of uh, dissipative capacity that we can get uh, with isolation devices. Uh, so the um, together with uh, we have we have seen uh, today an increasing uh, dissipative capacity of devices uh, from uh, low damping rubber bearings, approximately uh, seven to eight uh, percent. Then we have considered lead rubber bearings with 20, 22 percent of damping. Uh, and then uh, here the um, uh, curved surface slider with uh, uh, up to 40% of damping in some cases. And then we have uh, also the uh, recentering, uh, the recentering stiffness, uh, K recentering, uh, which is somewhere here. Okay, we have all the values that they vary just because uh, actually uh, we have uh, a varying uh, value of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, vertical load. So depending on the vertical load, the uh, equivalent radius of curvature is fixed. So uh, the, we will have uh, also a varying value of uh, uh, recentering stiffness. So what I want you to uh, consider now is uh, actually the uh, dependence uh, of the friction coefficient uh, with respect to the uh, maximum velocity, for instance. Uh, so we have a maximum velocity values uh, for all the tests. So we have, uh, you see, there are uh, a number of tests. Uh, yeah, the fourth, uh, you see, 
the fourth uh, test uh, is the, the one very slow uh, related to the triangular, uh, the triangular um, waveform. So let's check it uh, if I just consider the fourth one. Okay, everything is done. Is there any? Okay, so plot the displacement. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, okay, so we can say that um, I think we can apply these uh, and then uh, to consider the first and uh, the uh, and the last point. Okay, so uh, let's assume just a single um, rule for this test. Okay, so so if I f is equal to four. Let's say after these, and so the uh, I uh, the zero point, yeah, it should be only the uh, the middle point. So we zero point is equal to uh, one, then zero point, then uh, length of the okay. Okay, so you see now we have also the recentering behavior and also this is just one cycle, but we have also the friction coefficient, uh, I think, uh, yeah, 5%. Okay, perfect. So now we have everything, uh, we can go back. Triangular waveform uh, generally needs uh, a special definition for, um, for the zero points. Okay, these are all the cycles that we have always to check if everything works properly. Okay, uh, so now we want to check the uh, maximum velocity. I don't know why uh, there is four and not one. One, okay. We have to start from one to uh, the, all the uh, file numbers. Okay, so now let's consider the dependency of uh, uh, the friction coefficient with respect to the, uh, actually to the uh, sliding velocity and the vertical load. So in order to do this, we should also uh, store the uh, vertical load. Let's do it. Uh, the vertical load is just constant with respect to the, um, uh, to the test. So we can say here where we store the maximum velocity, vertical load equal to W. Okay. Okay, we have the ordinary figures, close all and CLC. Okay. So now we have also the vertical loads, uh, which is VL. Okay, you see, we have all the vertical loads. We start from uh, 430 kilonewtons uh, up to 3,180 uh, kilonewtons, uh, so three, 318 tons. So let's try to consider a plot of uh, the uh, velocity with respect to uh, the friction coefficient uh, as points. Okay, so you see that we have uh, an increasing value of friction coefficient as we consider the uh, 
rising value of a sliding velocity. Here we have something different. Okay, we have a um, for 0.4 meter per second velocity, I have provided much uh, di different values uh, uh, of uh, no, of actually uh, vertical load. So this means that we are able to notice uh, the vertical load dependency. But here for these tests, we are able to consider actually with the same vertical load the velocity effect. Let's check it through the vertical load. So we have uh, the test with the same vertical load are from the fourth to the uh, ninth. Okay, so let's check it from the fourth to the ninth, and the same uh, here from the fourth to the ninth. All the columns are related to the. Uh... Okay, you see we have uh, actually the uh, common behavior for the friction coefficient for these materials uh, we have uh, we starts from uh, 5% and that uh, of friction coefficient then it increases up to 50 millimeters per second of velocity and then it can be considered as constant value and then here we have uh, for all the cycles uh, a decreasing value this is uh, related to the uh, cyclic effect because uh, we generally assume that uh, the friction coefficient decreases as a, as a degradation of the effect of uh, multi-cyclic excitations. And now we want to see actually the uh, varying, uh, the varying effect of the, the dependency of the friction coefficient with respect to the applied vertical load. So we want to consider test one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, and then we have the ninth and the tenth. So we consider the vertical load. One, two, three, nine, and ten, which are the tests related to uh, the variation of vertical load by keeping the velocity constantly equal to 0.4 meter per second. And uh, uh, according also to the, uh, all the uh, performed cycles, uh, you see these, uh, which is called the uh, vertical load effect, which is actually a decreasing value of friction coefficient with respect to the increasing value of vertical load. And uh, um, our research has, uh, um, has shown that this effect can be uh, actually fairly modeled uh, through an exponential decay curve. Uh, as you can see, there is a, a sudden uh, initial significant de uh, degradation of friction coefficient and then it starts to be uh, a little bit constant uh, so this means that this is this can be addressed to uh, a decrease an exponential uh, an exponential decreasing trend uh, uh, related to the friction coefficient which starts from 14 percent which is a quite high value and then the asymptotic value is something like four percent so if we uh, had the the higher will be the vertical load applied to the device uh, the lower will be uh, also the friction coefficient to the device uh, because of the irregularities uh, of the sliding materials which gets smoother and smoother once uh, a high vertical load is applied and finally we can also check the decreasing value of friction coefficient as a function of the cyclic effect so we can check just for the last uh, for the last uh, um, test which is the tenth you see uh, also uh, we found that the uh, exponential decay trend uh, can be assumed also for the the, the cyclic effect so as the as you can consider uh, for all the tests, uh, we have uh, an exponentially decre uh, decreasing friction coefficient. And this is very useful for bound analysis uh, whenever we don't know actually what kind of constant friction coefficient value to assume. And uh, we, can uh, we can consider the limits uh, of the friction coefficient parameter for a given, uh, for a given specimen, for a given device, uh, and maybe uh, perform bound analysis by considering a long lasting uh, multi-cyclic excitation. So we get the minimum value of friction coefficient and the minimum value of friction coefficient generally leads uh, to uh, the highest value of displacements. Uh, and then uh, we consider also the maximum value of uh, friction coefficients uh, with, uh, which lead to the uh, maximum forces, uh, internal forces in the superstructure. 
Then last but not least, the last um, um, aspect that I want you to see is uh, actually the uh, figure which shows uh, the horizontal displacement with respect to the vertical one, which is the Z. And you see that this is actually the uh, shape. OK, you are expecting the pendulum to displace vertically upward. And this is actually a, defor a vertical deformation, which goes downward. Uh, but this is just because of uh, the uh, working principles of the testing equipment, because uh, the uh, portion of the bearing uh, which uh, actually moves uh, uh, vertically during motion is uh, actually the back, uh, the bottom plate, uh, because uh, the vertical load uh, is applied uh, into the testing equipment uh, through the vertical hydraulic jacks, which are beneath uh, the uh, sliding bench itself. So this means that it is uh, uh, the motion is applied uh, below the uh, the isolator. So we have uh, a, defor a deformed vertical shape, uh, which is actually which goes up, uh, actually up and down, but downwards. Okay. And uh, if we uh, write uh, axis uh, equal, this provides exactly the same scale uh, from uh, uh, for both the x and y axis. Uh, so you can see that there are uh, this is exactly the right curvature, which is performed through the um, uh, through the motion, the pendular motion of the of the device. And according to this, uh, we can maybe do some uh, a very fast curve fitting tool analysis uh, because according to this uh, um, to this deformed shape. Uh, we can actually assume that a custom equation for the representation of the vertical deflection, uh, I mean, for the, for the vertical motion of the device. And uh, actually, we have uh, mine, the equation of uh, uh, this motion, of this uh, spherical motion, which is minus the radius plus uh, the square root of r squared minus uh, uh, x squared. OK, you see that this is uh, actually the uh, best uh, the least square procedure. And we get the equivalent radius of curvature, which is exactly 3.07 uh, meters. Uh, and this was actually approximately the number I, I gave you at the beginning uh, for, the, for this device. There is something. Uh, something like a translation, uh, uh, even though you see the R squared is approximately 100%. So the, this is uh, approximately an exact fitting. Uh, in order to better characterize this deformed shape, uh, we could uh, also maybe provide a an horizontal translation according to this an additional parameter, which has to be uh, firstly defined uh, very, uh, very low just one centimeters maybe, okay. Yeah, the R squared now is 99.9%. Uh, .9%, so this is uh, approximately uh, exact fitting uh, and the radius uh, is uh, exactly the same as before. So uh, this is uh, a straightforward procedure to uh, actually to compute the equivalent radius of curvature directly from uh, the um, the deformed shape and actually the motion, also the vertical motion uh, returned by the testing equipment. And uh, if we go back by looking at the um, K residual for the last test, uh, if we perform uh, the applied vertical load divided by um, 3.073, we get this uh, K restoring. Uh, and uh, if we get K restoring for the last test. It is something in uh, something uh, very close to this number. So everything looks like working properly uh, from both the um, geometrical point of view, which is uh, the one provided by uh, actually the analysis of the motion together, uh, both the horizontal and the vertical together and the mechanical property coming from uh, actually the, uh, the analysis of uh, the force response of the device. 
Okay, so I think that uh, I have killed you uh, significantly with uh, all these uh, computations. Uh, yeah, I know that we have performed a, a, a lot of stuff, uh, um, but uh, I, I will provide the, the, all the scripts and uh, also the, um, uh, what, we have, what we have drawn here for all the equations that we need. Uh, is there any questions? Okay, uh, so um, I think that, yeah, there's, there's a question. Uh, no, but please, can you uh, send us all these codes? Because, yeah. uh, you know, at some point you, you were a bit fast, especially in the last one. So I'd like to revise what I, uh, what I thought. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Thank sorry. For, I'm sorry to be, uh, to, to have been fast, but uh, I wanted you to, to have a big picture of everything. Yeah, yeah, that was that was clear. I mean, yeah, uh, I will share much. everything. Uh, I I will share through the uh, shared folder in Google yeah. Drive. Uh, I will put uh, all this stuff. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. And if there is no other question, uh, we will see tomorrow. We will start uh, a, a brief tutorial uh, on uh, the uh, finite element modeling uh, strategies uh, with the software sub 2000. We will just see theory. Uh, very briefly, uh, just a presentation, uh, and then uh, on Friday we will see just fast rules uh, to design uh, isolation mm -hmm. systems, uh, and then next week uh, we will try to model actually a case study structure uh, to perform mm -hmm. and to perform mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. uh, nonlinear time history mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. So see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Have a nice night. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.